Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is freerunning athlete Tim Sheaf. Tim was the 2009 World Freerunning Champion and has won the Ninja Warrior UK competition twice. He co-founded the vegan clothing company Ethics and then this poster boy for veganism turned ex-vegan. Enjoy this episode as he shares his story and the reasons leading to his decision to eat animal products with Paul. And stay tuned to the end of the podcast for an amazing offer from Tim. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I am so excited today to share an amazing guest with you, Tim Sheaf. Tim, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Hey, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, man. I'm excited for this talk today. Well, I, I was very, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I don't watch television much. I'm not much of an internet guy. I'm extremely focused on my work and any spare time I have, I usually spend out creating rock sculptures, being with nature and doing my yeah. own spiritual practices and trying to stay out of the uh, kind of the, you know, the trap of modern digital craze. So um, it wasn't until my wife, Penny, who you were just speaking to briefly, forwarded me a an article about you and about what happened with your company and uh, your decision to uh, change your eating habits. And she said, knowing what I teach, she said, I really think you should look at this. This is somebody who you might find very interesting. And I read the article and I was very, very impressed with your honesty. And I said to Penny, as soon as I finished reading it, I got to do a podcast with this guy because more people need to know about him. And then as I looked into the research, I had Penny do a bunch of background research on you. And I didn't realize that you had reached such a, a really high level. I mean, you've got some amazing accomplishments uh, athletically. And I will refer to this later. But as I looked into your style of exercise, it was totally in line with what I teach. And I was really impressed. And I'm not an easy guy to impress. <laughs> 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 so, um, could you give us an overview of your path to becoming such an accomplished athlete? Mm. And and then in that uh, process, maybe you could share what ultimately led to your becoming a vegan. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Paul. Um, and make make sure you tell us some of your accomplishments because. Uh, I don't think sure. I, I don't know how many of my listeners will know you. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and I, it's really your accomplishments are very impressive. Sure, yeah. I started as as any kid in England, played a lot of uh, football or as you'd say soccer, um, but was always fascinated whenever I'd see like you know Michael Jackson or or gymnasts on TV, and I wanted to get into gymnastics, but I couldn't find a gymnastics gym near me. I ended up getting into breakdancing, which was which really piqued my interest and I, I really fell in love with just body movement and natural movement and uh, then from that when I was about 15 I got into uh, parkour or free running as it's sort of inter interchangeably called and I, I did that for well I, since then onwards really and in uh, 2009 I went on to win the world free running championships um, and I won some Red Bull art of motion competitions since then and so that was sort of my free running. And then I got into uh, Ninja Warrior and I competed on American Ninja Warrior. I made the final in Vegas uh, twice, uh, about four or five years ago. And then I also competed on American Ninja Warrior as captain of Team Europe. And we went on to win uh, against America and Japan in the first season uh, when we had American Ninja Warrior uh, versus the world. <clears throat> so that was a lot of my history it was was a lot of movement based stuff the ninja type movements free running flips somersaults gymnastics breakdancing i just love being a human with a body and and appreciating that in and exploring that and creating with that that was really something that's in my in my soul in my nature that i, I was just born with that desire to to explore that realm um, isn't it i just wanted to share real quick isn't it absolutely fucking awesome the beauty and the complexity and the integration and the wisdom in a human body every year i appreciate it more and more and, and more depths and more depths and 
I think the only people like Da Vinci or someone could, you know, the level that he must have, have investigated and comprehended it at, uh, had some glimpses into how inspired he must have been in my time. But yeah, I really, it's such a beautiful piece of machinery. And isn't it sad how many people today just basically negate their bodies? And even more sad is the Abrahamic religious traditions, uh, such as Christianity, Judaism, and monotheism, those are the Abrahamic religions. They all, in their own ways, shun the body or, or you know, make it evil or uh, have a mm. negative orientation, not only to the body, but to the ego. And I think because 85% of people worldwide claim religious affiliation, and those are three of their largest religious influences on human beings, I think that there's a real unconscious programmed bias against the body. And we have so many taboos from all these religious ideas, from sexual pleasure to music to clothing to dance to you name it, mm. that almost mm. anything that gives a person the kind of joy of the child, the spontaneous expression of self has become so-called sinful. So when I, when I see a guy like you out there really like fully inhabiting their body, I celebrate that. So congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, yeah. It's the one gift that we're born into this 3d realm with, like we have, we have our mind, which, you know, wherever that, that whatever realm that exists, but for the 3d realm to traverse it, we've got this one vehicle, it's the ultimate gift and it's so under it's misunderstood underappreciated yeah like you said and whether that's our own our own doing society's doing it's it's or culture yeah religion it's a shame and i guess the best way is just to try and uh, inspire people through helping them find health which is what you do and uh, <laughs> what what's my journey is the same is to find my own health and for me I guess I, I, as an athlete and a younger athlete at, the, at that time, I'm currently 31 now, born in 88. Um, I'd never looked into nutrition too much. You know, when you're younger, you can get away with eating whatever. And um, yeah, I could go into how I became vegan now if you wanted me to lead that in. Well, I, I'd like, I'd love, I'd love you to do that. But uh, I, you just said something quite interesting. You were born the year I began traveling the world, giving lectures on the dangers of fixed access machine training and isolation training and showing people that we'd made a very dangerous wrong turn and provided science that was undeniable and <laughs> often got a very cold reception to the facts. But really, I was probably the first guy out there to teach what functional movement was and unveiled my primal pattern movement system and my system of movement analysis. And uh, ultimately, wow. I've consulted for many, many uh, professional sports teams, Olympic committees, militaries, and all sorts of stuff due to my work and, and development and demonstrating to athletes worldwide when I would go to do, you know, consulting with them. I would do demonstrations in the gym that usually freak these guys out because here I am a therapist and I can almost always outlift pretty much every guy on the team. And that really <laughs> tripped their minds out. Wow. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, let's let's hear about your evolution into veganism. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, just on that note, as you said, I, you were the first person I remember pointing out in, in your book, Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. I read it about seven years ago. How you would take injured athletes back to their child, like back to baby movements and build them from that yes. strength. And that, that triggered something that made so much sense to me, and I've used that since. So thank you so much for that. Um, so, yeah, I... About 25 years old, um, I had a friend who was vegetarian and I was on a job uh, actually for Coca-Cola, ironically. This is before any sort of, I'd, I'd sort of look into what integrity was, but uh, I was doing an advert for Coca-Cola out in Bucharest and I spoke to my friend uh, who was vegetarian and I said, you know what, I'll try it for a week. I'd never even thought about it or anything at that point. And I went, went back home to my flat in London where I was living at the time. And I think I must have tweeted, I'm trying vegetarian for a week. And someone must have sent me a video. I remember tidying my room and watching this video by a, a very inspiring guy to me for many years, Gary Urovsky. And it's called The Greatest Speech You'll Ever Hear. Um, and it, 
inspired a lot of people to go vegan. He spoke a lot of truth. My journey into it, I think, came sort of through Eckhart Tolle in the sense that that was my first spiritual understanding when I'd uh, read his A New Earth and started to understand a bit more of my own mindset, my own ego at that point. And that was an amazing, inspiring moment in my life, but at the same time very, and this is any sort of awakening moment, there's a breakdown and a real depression that comes with it. And so it was that flux of like, oh, I understand, like I never understood before. Oh my God, what have my my eyes open to seeing in the world now? I can see everyone's playing a character and isn't the true authentic self and all, all this crazy awareness. But anyway, in that understanding, lined up with veganism and seeing, oh, how do I have a right to eat an animal if it's not a necessity? Why do I have a right for an animal should die for me to have a meal? And, I, and it made so much sense to me. No, it's not a necessity. Look at this guy. He's, he's mentioned all the science is fine. Um, I saw the way that animals were treated and some of the slaughterhouse videos, and I was so shocked because at never at any point in my life had I considered that process. And so there was a it was an emotional decision. And now when we choose emotionally, it's not always rationally, is it? And so in an emotional fire, inspiration within me, I was like, that's it. Like that, that was me going vegan overnight essentially was to, to hear this, to see what the cruelty to the animals, not wanting to be someone who would contribute to that. And, uh, thinking that it was, it was, uh, just with the understanding I had at the time and just went sort of both feet or head first into it. Well, I think, I think, you know, I've been around long enough and I have, uh, you know, a deep enough spiritual practice. I've, uh, now probably been through somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 shamanic medicine journeys and gone extremely deep. And I've been a practitioner of Tai Chi and Qigong for about 17 years. And I've gone as deep in Tai Chi, Qigong and meditation as I have on the medicines, which was important to me. Do you mind mentioning which, which medicines, Paul? Do you mind if I ask you that? Yeah, well, I've been researching this and you know i have a a federal license as a medicine man spirit guide through the native american council so i can use them in a properly run native american healing ceremony but uh, ayahuasca mushrooms yeah i'll I'll give you a list i did a year of i did a year of training with a doctor that uses them clinically so that i could learn how to use them and uh you know really get some experience so i i wasn't just jumping in blindly and and <laughs> could have some knowledge. And I spent years doing research on myself and uh, doing extensive documentation throughout the process and testing different doses. And I would basically take progressively higher doses until I hit psychosis. So I'd, I'd have a sitter to watch over me. And, but uh, I've worked with uh, several, many different types of mushrooms. I've worked with several different types of DMT. I've worked with mescaline. I've worked with uh, San Pedro. I've worked with uh, a lot of ayahuasca. I make my own tea. I have been making my own tea for probably about 12 years. Uh, let's see, what else have I worked with? Um uh, Cambo. Some ver- uh, I haven't tried Cambo. I haven't been attracted to that. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, lo- a lot of LSD journeys uh, over the years, uh, you know, those things with the medicines like that, it's as available. I'm not allowed to use LSD in my clinical practice or my work as a medicine man spirit guide because it's a synthesized molecule. I'm only allowed to use natural substances. So that research was strictly on my own. Uh, but I probably have done about a hundred uh, ceremonies using LSD to really understand that molecule and how it works. And uh, it's very, very powerful and very, very effective if used correctly. So um, just off the top of my head, unless you started rattling off names, those are the main ones that I've used. So lots of different mushrooms, DM, several different types of DMT, mescaline, um, Ayahuasca, um, San Pedro uh, and peyote. Yeah, San Pedro. Uh, I haven't done peyote that that particular uh, medicine, but I would love to someday. Mm, I've tried that one in a, a Ibiza in a ceremony. Was it good? Yeah, very heart opening. Very subtle, but very green. Anything that opens the heart is good. Yeah. 
as I tell the young men, it's good to have a heart on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, in, in my work uh, with patients, as I said earlier, I've been doing this for 35 years, and, and there's been a long string of vegans and vegetarians I've rehabilitated uh, due to health problems. Many of them began their journey because they had a chronic illness or cancer. And a therapist or somebody that was guiding them, the doctor put them on a vegetarian or vegan diet and they cured their cancer with that approach. But then they began to really believe that was the way they should live forever. And once again, they stopped paying attention to what their body was telling them. And so by the time they got to me, they had the telltale signs of protein deficiency, hormonal collapse, adrenal exhaustion. And oftentimes these people get a lot of fungal and parasite infections because so far most of the vegans and vegetarians that I've been coaching are eating far too much carbohydrate for their body's needs. And whenever you do that, you open the door wide for fungal and parasite infections. So I don't think I've ever worked with a vegan yet that didn't have that problem or a vegetarian. But uh, I went on my own quest. My soul directed me to become a vegetarian. And I went deep into a lot of spiritual practices and uh, working with spirit guides and getting up at 3.30 in the morning pretty much every day and going to the office well before people got there. And in that process, I was being guided to work with a lot of different Native American approaches and channel, channel uh, chanting, rattling, drumming, singing, um, meditating, and working with various crystals, stone, various types of healing stones, tuning forks, healing instruments. And I found that the vegetarian diet really, uh, best the best way to describe it, it was just like my uh, sixth and seventh chakras were much more open and my ability to connect to higher dimensions and even lower dimensions. It was like the access was much better. But what happened was over time, I found it impossible no matter how i tried food combining or various approaches to supplementation that i just could not keep muscle mass on and i ended up going from about 180 pounds down to 164 pounds and i kept saying to my soul because you know i'd smell meat or eggs because you know my 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 wives and everybody around me were cooking and i would like oh my god i just want to eat that right now but my soul said no and it was exactly one year to the day when I got the green light to go ahead and eat some fish and eggs and then six months later I got the green light to just return back so I did a good solid tour and when I was about 13 my mother who became a member of the self-realization fellowship under the guidance of Paramahansa Yogananda uh, went into a vegetarian lifestyle and encouraged me to do it with her. But after six months, I became anemic and she, we didn't know what was wrong, but I was just feeling very weak and was getting headaches and just couldn't think at school. And she took me to a naturopathic physician and she said, this kid just needs a steak and he'll be fine. So we went home and I ate some meat and everything cleared up within about 24 hours. But uh, it was very important to me to, to walk both sides. So I'm not just talking up, you know, my ass, so to speak. I don't like to talk about things that I don't really have experience of, especially as a therapist or a teacher, because I think that's typical professor silliness. Hi, this is Paul Check, and I am super excited to share an amazing line of super nutritional products that I found called Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. If you go to Organifi.com and check out their product line, they have a wide variety of excellent products. And unlike any food-based product company that's ever showed interest in sponsoring the Czech Institute or any of my courses or products or videos or any of the projects I've done that stated they were organic, when I asked them for their organic certification, I never got them. I have been through this before. When I contacted Organifi and asked to see their documentation that they were legitimately using organic source materials. Very quickly, I got an email with 14 
organic certification showing that their source materials are certified organic. Then I put the products to the test with my family and on my own body, and I must say I was very impressed. They have a wide variety. They have green juice, red juice. They have a product called Gold that aids with sleep, muscle aches and pains, and joint stiffness. It helps bolster your immunity. It's awesome. One of my favorites is called Pure, and it's got lion's mane. It's Bobab infused. It's great for gut health, brain performance. Lion's mane is excellent for stimulating neurogenesis. I love to give it to my son, Mana. Another one that's fantastic is Immunity, which is an organic superfood product, and it supports your immune system. It tastes fantastic. I like to put these right in some water and mix them in and drink them or put them into tea. They have a variety of great stuff like green juices, red juice. They have Organifi Gold. It aids with restless sleep, muscle aches and pain, stiff joints, bolsters your immunity. You'll wake up feeling rejuvenated if you have that in the evening. They have awesome protein powders. Angie's about to give birth to our second child and she's been really enjoying their protein powder. Their products are safe for pregnant mothers. I'm a very picky guy and I'm hard to impress when it comes to food products. But these guys really got me. I love the products. If you are ready to try some amazing products that can really make your life more efficient, if you don't have time to do a lot of cooking, you're a busy executive or you're a mother and you've got lots going on and you need something to give your kids now and then that's legitimately nutritious, good for them, and organic, which means clean and high in nutrients, you can't go wrong with Organifi. Go to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com, and when you're checking out, put in check 20s, lowercase c, lowercase h, lowercase e, lowercase k, 20, and you will get a 20% off at checkout, and you will be amazed, just like I was. Can't wait to hear your feedback. Check them out, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com. When you're checking out, use the code C-H-E-K-20 for a 20% discount and prepare to be nourished, enlivened, and amazed. I'd love to hear your feedback. You know, this is a very important process you're going through. And as I said, I was very, very impressed with how you handled yourself. So yeah. my, my approach really is there's no such thing as the right diet. And what I've found through the system that I teach, which people can access at the Czech Institute website, checkinstitute.com, I took a chunk out of my holistic lifestyle coach level two, which is our professional training program for people that want to be holistic lifestyle coaches. And I put a system together years ago called Primal Pattern Eating, which is what I've been teaching my patients for a very long time, which shows people three ways to access themselves. Uh, one is using a system of diet logging and symptom logging for self-analysis. The next is muscle testing. The next is I teach people how to access their own soul for inner guidance. And I've worked with countless people that have come to me after seeing many doctors and trying every diet and pill and surgery you can imagine. And usually within as little as two months, they're radically improved and they have a much deeper relationship with themselves. And in my own work with my body over my life, I've, I've been a you know very competitive athlete in many sports, but... Uh, I found it's very interesting. For example, if I do deadlifts like I did this morning, I will be very hungry for flesh food for a couple of days. But if I take a day off or two days off, I can go right down to a vegetarian diet and feel completely satiated. And so I find that physical stress, emotional stress, mental stress, and the level of busyness in a person's life, how much sleep they're getting or not getting, and other environmental factors such as how hot or cold it is all actually are effects that modulate 
our inner environment and result in the need for either increases or decreases of any of the macronutrients or even micronutrients. But until someone actually spends the time to do what you're doing, which is develop an intimate relationship with your body and trust your body as really as an essential level of your own consciousness, which interestingly, if you look at the fact that the autonomic nervous system regulates 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second and all of our physiological systems, it's really kind of a paradox that we refer to consciousness as what our ego perceives when really the largest body of our consciousness is centered within our body systems. And most people, uh, <laughs> they, don't, they don't access that. They just keep on listening to professors and media instead. So I'd love to hear what you have learned through your own process of uh, veganism and where you yeah. stand with all that now. Man, it was it was quite the journey. So that was six years ago. I just entered uh, into veganism, made sense to me from a spiritual standpoint, from a, a biological standpoint. I was fed the information that it was fine for everyone. Um, I after about three years, I think I started to feel not quite. I felt great in the beginning, and I did feel relief. Like you said, people get over cancer, and I did feel some sort of feel better and lighter, and my job or career is about strength to body weight ratio so I lost some inefficient muscle mass but I was still very strong in compared to my body weight and I after about three years I started to detect something wasn't quite right um so I I continued to search for the diet and that's when I entered sort of raw veganism fruitarian and and spiritually again fruitarian made the most sense because in if trying you know if, if spirituality is trying to do less harm if that's what it was to me at the time fruit doesn't harm the plant. If you eat lettuce, you still have to kill the lettuce or spinach or whatever. And I understand that, right? So when you eat fruit, it, it wants you to take it. It gives you the seeds. Now, I have a very different understanding of it. But at the time, fruitarian seemed to make the most sense to me in terms of doing the least harm on the planet. And, of course, the fruit now isn't what it originally was, and there's, there's a whole other thing. But that, that gave me some relief. And like you said, spiritually, I felt way more aligned. I could really channel in conversations when I was talking to camera or in podcasts or interviews I would really have a flow I'd be impressed just witnessing myself speak what's felt like truth and I just I did feel very aligned in that state but slowly slowly my body started to break down and I was really searching to solve uh, my issues within veganism within the vegan bubble and so I tried things I tried some supplementation b12 injections didn't really feel much I uh, I got into urine therapy, which actually really helped. Uh, and I later discovered that might be because it recycles proteins. And when you're vegan, you need to re recycle as many proteins as you can. And that, that, I'm sure you'd be interested in that conversation. Maybe we can go into that in a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm familiar. I, I, I've looked into it. I've yeah. uh, had various clients that used it. Some of my, One of my instructors went through it. So I'm yeah. pretty hip on it. But yeah. you're more than welcome to share uh, yeah. whatever you want. In fact, in, in shamanism... I don't know if you know this, but the Amanita muscaris mushrooms, mushrooms are you flow through. Yeah, they flow, the reindeer, they collect it from the reindeer to avoid the toxins. Well, actually, the shaman would, uh, the Tibetan shaman would eat the Amanita muscaris mushroom. But actually, it turns out that when the molecule goes through your body, it actually yeah. becomes more active. So they drink their urine, and that's what takes you deep into the actual medicine experience of that particular mushroom. Yeah. And I think. Randomly on that point, the men's penis looks like a mushroom, and I just wonder if there's a coincidence there with the. <laughs> well, I think the mushrooms are far more intelligent than the average man's penis. <laughs> there's this old saying: "A stiff dick has no consciousness," and I think Amen, it takes yeah. us a while. It takes us a while to figure out how to manage that when, when our consciousness drops down to that Shoots level. But down, yeah. Wow, you, well, you think I'd have, here I am, fifty-seven with a three-year-old and a new baby on the way. So it, it seems right. like uh, Some the power right. of nature is is overpowering my rational mind. But I <laughs> can tell you that my 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 having you know I have a son that's thirty-nine. He'll be forty this summer, and right. and uh, so what I've learned is that great spirit brought me my little boy at just the right time to really blow my heart wide open and reconnect me with all those beautiful primal movements and getting back on the ground and mm. playing with him. So 
Mm. Uh, sometimes the mystery is greater than the rational mind can comprehend. That's one of the things I've learned and that I worship every day. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly see that. And I just, I just followed what I was guided to do in each moment. So in each moment, I felt sort of being guided, maybe not what conventionally people would have done, but something I was led to do that I enjoyed being, I'm an explorer in, in life, and I enjoyed exploring these realms and entering these, seeing these communities and seeing the intelligence of the people within them or the, the balance or the lack of balance. You know, I, I enjoy delving into these strange aspects and, uh, that exist within our society today. And so I went to the raw, certain things improved, certain things got worse. Um, I, and slowly, slowly, I felt like I was being boxed into a corner. The walls were closing in on everything. My muscles would not recover. I was getting injured just doing press-ups or yoga. All I was able to do was really slow movements in, in the gym, like hanging. I couldn't do anything explosive. Uh, I got some digestive issues, some you know, real candida flare-ups and all of this. And so it led me to look into fasting. And uh, a lot of people were doing intermittent fasting, but I was looking into real long-term fasting. Uh, and I ended up starting a, a seven day water fast. And I was, while I was doing the fast, I was reading about a water only fast. I was reading Dr. Arnold Eric's book, uh, who's a, an old school professor on the mucusless diet. And he fasted and Dr. Uh, Shelton, Robert Shelton, I think it is something Shelton. And he'd fasted 40,000 people spoke to Gandhi around the times of his fast. And he was sort of his advisor. And I was studying this and I did my seven days. And at the end of it, it seemed like there was no point stopping then if you wanted to get the deep healing you had to go to sort of 21 30 days so i aimed to go to yeah. 21 got to 21 felt all right to carry on to be honest the first three four days were the hardest but beyond that i spent a lot of time at home and and just chilled out i got to 21 uh then i was going to go to 28 to make it four weeks one complete moon cycle i thought let me get to one moon cycle my mum was starting to get really worried at this point and uh i promised her i'd stop on 28 and then when i got to 28 i didn't I realized I'd started the fast for me, not for my mother, and to end it for her wouldn't be, it, it would be like, it was the weird spiritual dilemma in my head because it's the nice thing to do to stop scaring your mother, but at the same time, I'm my own human and this is my choice in my life and I, want, I was guided to carry on. So I carried on until day 33, I woke up and uh, my heart wasn't in it. I didn't feel good at that point and I said, okay, I'll, I'll end, well, it was day 34 and I said, I'll end tomorrow. Um, and so on day 35, I, I broke my 35 day water fast. And within that, I, I was clearly searching for something and asking a, a big question and coming out of it, going back to all this research I read on why raw veganism was the best diet, although these books were written in the early 19th century. So, um, there may be a, a massive difference in the nutrition of the vegetables and fruits now, and then maybe it was possible then, or maybe it was it was nonsense all along. But anyway, I came back to raw vegan and it didn't feel good. My symptoms came, all came back while I was fasting. All my symptoms cleared. My toenail fungus started to clear. And my all my my gut, my joints felt a lot clearer and freer. My spine felt a lot more loose, and I came back, and all the, the issues came back. I I was never satiated. I would over consume because I was, my body was asking me for something that either I grew up on, my ancestors lived on or something it was asking. And I was giving it carbs, giving it carbs, giving it fruit. And it, it just wouldn't ever feel satiated. And so I'd over consume, um, got to a point when I, you know, occasionally I'd uh, not, not often but once or twice, I'd go to the bathroom to throw up because I was like, this is just not comfortable in my stomach. I may as well just get it out now in just an old school Greek kind of way. And, um, and, that, and that wasn't my fault. That was my body asking me for something I wasn't giving it. And so I eventually came to, to the conclusion that what if it's the diet? What if it's the, the ism itself that is locking me from finding health? There's, I know I'm you know, asking the right question. I'm following my path. I'm doing everything. I'd, I had one friend that stopped being vegan and shout out Avian. I, and, I, and he and I thought he just needs to fast. I'm doing the fast. He just has gone back to me. He needs to fast. And then when I, eventually I came to the realization, oh, it's me that takes the L here. It's me that <laughs> might be wrong here potentially. So I, I, I got some s local eggs and some wild caught salmon and, and I did research. I watched your videos, you talking with the raw bras and some really good information on that. And your story about the persimmon farm next door when they shot the deers for your persimmon. I was like, well, if animals are dying for my choices anyway, if, if animals are there's still suffering going on and I'm suffering, well, why not m make a conscious choice to consume an animal? Therefore, I can pray for what's on my plate and know that animal died. Whereas with, I realized with a lot of vegan products and, and vegetables, animals will die, but on the outskirts of the perimeters when they're being poisoned and you'll never know it's not an ingredient. You won't, you can't take responsibility for it. 
Now, I'd, I'd rather take responsibility for the animals that died and may as well use that if, if that is fuel for a human to, to use it. And so I had salmon and eggs and within, you know, I had I had, had two eggs raw first and then I, I cooked some salmon and had that. And the very night after the first day that I had salmon, and I, I mentioned this in the video that sort of made my story go a bit viral. And I just think it's interesting. And I think a doctor would find it interesting. I'm sure you do. And and if we're not in the high school and we don't want to make jokes, I think it's fascinating. I, I had a wet dream that night and I hadn't ejaculated in about two months due to my, uh, during the fast. Spiritually, you're not in that place. You're not thinking about it mentally. It wasn't really around females. But that night, after the first time I had a piece of animal flesh within, after six years, I had a, a wet dream just forced, you know, came out and I felt warmer. I, uh, all these things started to re-engage in my body and slowly it, it was like a, a massive like I, I actually, it, it was the most crazy thing because my, I'd built up a, a vegan persona. I was a, the one of the vegan athletes. I was in uh, What the Health. I'd filmed for Game Changers, which is coming out. I, mean, I subsequently had to let them know that to take me out of it. Um, I'd filmed as a vegan uh, athlete for some Jamie Oliver show in, the, in England while I was on my fast. I, I, I was one of the go-to vegan athletes in that community, and I had a business which you know, 90, 95% of our customers are vegans. Uh, my whole life and identity was attached to this. And I was asking for healing and the universe wanted me to sacrifice everything I'd built for my own health. And, and yeah, I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't deny it. It made total sense to me that I was deeply like for healing. It's about returning to whole for me, a return to whole and attachments sort of stopped me from being whole attachments to veganism attachments. To, to anything really in this world it, it's hold, held me back and so I was deeply ingrained in veganism and veganism was clearly deeply ingrained to me because when I came public that I was no longer vegan for health reasons there was an almighty stir in that community <laughs> Woo-hoo! hey baby well that's first of all uh, I didn't want to interrupt you because I was just I just want to let you have your flow but uh I'm a guy that does a lot of dream analysis with my patients because the psyche speaks to us in symbol and in image and in metaphor mm. at night when our ego can't defend itself or, or uh, filter wow. or block it. Yeah. And your wet dream is your soul saying, congratulations, young men, you're learning to listen. <laughs> Uh, thanks tell the vegans that (laughs) well you know the thing is i think you know a lot of people misunderstand me they think i'm anti-vegan or Mm anti-vegetarian or even anti-christian or anti-religion it's just not true i'm all about listening worshiping and participating as ken wilbert beautifully says and dustin diperna in order for us to evolve we have to wake up grow up and show up and wow. the reality of it is, is that, I'll, and we'll get into this in a minute, so I don't want to jump ahead, but a lot of what people do is pro- socially programmed behavior, and it's not conscious behavior. It's really just doing what other people are doing to try to fit in. But I am absolutely proud of you, and the experiences that you just described are, are totally congruent with what I was starting to feel about six months in, but I was maintaining a heavy weightlifting program. And, uh, you know, I lift very, I don't see, I don't know if if you've seen pictures of me lifting stones, but I lift big stones. I mean, I go out there with guys that are, you know, stronger than me in the gym, but they can't even lift the stones that I can lift. And they they don't know how I do. I see you on Instagram doing those stones. It looks really cool. Yeah. Well, one day you got to get yourself out here and, lift some stones with me and do some meditations and we'll do a ceremony or something together. Beautiful. As a listener of Living 4D with Paul Check, we know you're dedicated to mastery, mastering your health, mastering your profession, mastering parenting, mastering your dream. And mastery was exactly what Paul and Gavin Jennings had in mind when they created the Czech Academy. It's about creating true masters in resolving deep health challenges and masters of optimal human performance. So, how do you reach this mastery? 
Students of the Czech Academy learn the essential components of what it means to be a human being and to have a body. They learn to see how diet, lifestyle, exercise, and mental-emotional factors interact with one another and need to be addressed. And they are trained to use a massive toolkit of assessments to provide them with deep insights into their clients. In short, you'll learn Paul Czech's entire system of holistic health from A to Z. And from the first moment of the academy, you'll practice what you learn in your own life. That's the key to real mastery and personal growth. The Academy also supports each and every student with mentorships, faculty who are themselves mastered in their fields, and a passionate community of fellow students and practitioners. That means you'll have all the support you need to implement what you learn in your life and in your practice. And you'll achieve all this for an affordable monthly fee. If you have the commitment, passion, and dedication it takes to become a true master of holistic health coaching, then we invite you to apply to the Czech Academy now. Visit us online at czechacademy.com. Now, back to Living 4D with Paul Czech. But, uh, you know, the the uh, other thing is, uh, just for people that are interested, there is a very good documentary, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, called The Science of Fasting. Yeah, I watched that one. Yeah, that's one that I recommend to people because uh, every now and then I have to put people on fast to get rid of their parasite infections because uh, fungal infections can get really tricky to treat. And the cells that a fungus are made of actually turn out to be the closest to human flesh. So any of the drugs that kill funguses are actually very uh, toxic to the human body because they can kill our own cells. So uh, fungal infections are are not an easy one to get rid of uh, through over-the-counter means, which I think is perfect because... That's why I didn't try that stuff. Yeah, that's why I was like, fasting made more sense to me. Yeah, and and I think it's good because we really need our funguses and our parasites to inform us when we're eating wrong. They're opportunistic organisms. So whenever we're eating a surplus of food that the body doesn't need, our blood levels of it get too high. So if you're eating too much sweet stuff, then you have a surplus of carbohydrate in the body and the parasites, which are mother nature's decomposers, their balance, their, their, their function is to bring balance. So if we're eating too much flesh or too much low quality food that doesn't have nutrition and they come to decompose all that, and fasting, uh, there's over a thousand parasites that will infect the human body. But to this day, today, they only test for prob- most tests or the best tests I've seen only test for about 150. So I've had many, many people, vegetarian, vegan, and otherwise, that show up negative over and over again on tests. But clearly, they have the symptoms of fungal and parasite infections. And so fasting is one of the backups because if you starve them out, then your immune system can catch up. And you can never really get rid of uh, funguses and parasites in the body because we're breathing them in constantly. We're drinking them. We're eating them. They're in the environment. They come through our skin. They're everywhere. They're they're through sexual contact, through actually one of the most potent places for transferring parasites is money. It's constantly being touched by people that are touching their noses and their snot and their genitals and so people don't realize that, but these bugs are being transferred constantly in the environment and they're masters of survival. So uh, fasting is a, is one of my fallbacks. And actually, I, I learned that approach from an excellent book. Have you ever heard of the book called Healing with Whole Foods by Paul Pitchford? No, I haven't. It's a great resource. I highly recommend it. Um, but anyhow, uh, you know, one of the, the issues is that... Um, that I wanted to discuss with you is that the vegans and the vegetarians as a whole seem to be drawing a metaphorical line in the sand and creating the illusion that on one side of that line is animals and that they're conscious and that human beings are conscious. But on the other side is the plant kingdom and the the trees and all the things that they give themselves permission to eat. And they're acting as though those things somehow are not conscious and don't feel pain. But this goes completely against thousands of years of the shamanic tradition 
and it goes against the research of people like Cleve Baxter, Baxter whose book Primary Perception is mind blowing. Are you familiar with that book? No, I haven't. I haven't heard of that one. Either. Oh my God! You got to get the book Primary Perception. Cleve Baxter is the guy that actually invented the telegraph, uh, the the lie detector test, wow. and yeah. and he's the one that taught the FBI and the Secret Service and government agencies how to use it, and. Are you familiar with the book The Secret Life of Plants by Tompkins yeah. and Burt? Well, he's yeah, he's the guy that he provided all the equipment and taught them how to do the research where they were connecting the lie detector test to plants and finding out that plants were highly conscious. But in his book Primary Perception, he not only goes into plants, but he goes into eggs. He goes into bacteria. He does wild experiments like hooks the lie detector test up to a, uh, a, a test tube with yogurt in it. And they took yogurt, put it in the test tube. And then he had his researcher take a, a test tube of yogurt and drive like six miles from the laboratory. And he hooked his lie detector test to the rest of the yogurt in the cup, in the container that he took the yogurt out of. And then he called the, the guy on the phone and said, okay, whenever you want to, hold a match up to that yogurt in the test tube. And he measured and instantaneously the yogurt in the laboratory began to react as though it was in a state <laughs> of shock and trauma. And wow. he found that he found this is true of even bacteria. He found that the bacteria in our kitchen sinks would react with a fear reaction and a conscious reaction, the instant somebody moved towards it with hot water, like when you pour hot water down the sink or put anything hot in the sink, he took eggs and he hooked eggs up to a lie detector. And then he took one of the eggs out of the carton. And right when he was about to drop it in boiling water, like to boil the egg, to make a hard boiled egg, all the eggs in the carton reacted as, as though they were very scared. And, and he clearly showed that everything is interconnected. Everything's talking to everything. Then there's another book, The Secret Life of Your Cells by Robert D. Uh, B. Stone, PhD, that goes into all sorts of these things. Rudolf Steiner's teachings are extensive on plant consciousness, animal consciousness, even mineral consciousness. And I've studied Steiner for you know 25 years. Then there's another great researcher who named Monica Gagliano, author of the book, Thus spoke the plant, a remarkable journey of groundbreaking scientific discoveries and personal encounters with plants. There's now great documentaries showing that trees have families, that they protect their young, that trees communicate with each other and share nutrients under the soil. Then you've got all the research on fungi and uh, uh, Paul Stamets and many others showing how conscious they are. And of course, anybody that's ever ingested fungi, <laughs> a psychedelic fungi knows that those little beings know how to communicate to you and show you where your shit's at. Mm -hmm. So the point that I'm making is this is sort of a, a, a dangerous game of unconsciousness and it leads to people having this sort of uh, egotistical concept that they're protecting nature well, at the same time, the grand majority of vegans and vegetarians are not eating organic or biodynamically raised food. So they're actually putting money into the farming practices that are destroying the entire planet. Then if you look at the research in the agricultural circles, such as Lady Eve Balfour, who is really the founder of the term organic, because she's right from England. And her book was first published, I believe, in either 43 or 46. It's called The Living Soil and the Holly Experiment. If you haven't read it, it'll blow your mind. But, you know, there's, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the research she showed. She showed, as, as have others like Elaine Ingham, that 85% of all plants in nature are mycorrhizaformers, which means they have a functional relationship with the fungi. And what it turns out is that the funguses produce acids that can dissolve minerals and turn an inert mineral into a bioavailable mineral. And they dissolve the minerals in the, in the rocks and in the soil, and they send spores up the plant roots. So just imagine a catheter going up your penis. Well, the fungus send filaments up the roots, 
And in trade for bringing uh, organic minerals into the plants to support them and food into the plants, they drink the sap of the plant, which is high in carbohydrate, which is their preferred foods. But one of the things that Lady Eve Balfour was the first to show, and she's actually got pictures of it in her book, is that the fungi will create a web around their host plants. And if any parasitic organism tries to attack that plant, they will actually entangle that organism and eat it from the inside out and feed it to the plant. Now, scientifically speaking and taxonomically speaking, insects and worms are animals. So what we just learned, and, and, and you can look at the work of Elaine Ingham and her Soil Food Web, who's a very famous soil scientist, whose course, I've done some coursework of hers. I've studied uh, the science and agriculture with uh, Arden Anderson, who wrote the book Science and Agriculture. And I've done his course on agronomy and soil science and others like Kerry Reams. And what you find out is that the plants themselves are carnivorous, except it's being fed to them by the fungus because the funguses have the power to break them down and digest them and feed them as bioavailable minerals. So really, you could say the stomach is the, the fungi is an extension of the plant, which performs the function of our digestive tract. And it makes me sad when I see all this sort of demarcation of consciousness. And the reason I was uh, referring to the Lady Eve Balfour's book, and then there's also a series of books by a British farmer named Fred Sykes. And what they show over and over again is that whenever you farm fields commercially, there's about a 65% reduction in bird and animal traffic. And there's uh, there's a great video, I'm trying to remember the name of it now, but it it shows how when cows are put in fields that are farmed commercially, but there's a field next to it that's, that's farmed organically, that the cows will practically kill themselves sticking their heads through the fence to try to eat all the grass outside the fields that are chemically fertilized and sprayed with pesticides to the point that they will actually hurt themselves and damage the fences. And they will eat that food until it's completely and utterly gone before they'll eat the food in the field that's been treated with chemicals. So when you look at the reality of the fact, you know, many, many shaman, I've gotten a very comprehensive library. I've studied shamanic traditions from around the world. I am a practicing shaman. And if you start tracking back where the shaman got their recipes for all their medicines, such as ayahuasca, every one of them says they... They learned it from the plants. And in my work, I've learned many things from plants and trees. Too much to even begin. I could do an entire series of podcasts on it. But I'll give you an example of the wisdom in a tree. One time I was doing a medicine journey, ayahuasca actually, and it was in the summertime and the orange trees were blossoming. And I was standing outside talking to one of my orange trees and the orange tree said to me, look at the sun. And I said, the sun is too bright. It will hurt my eyes. And the orange tree said, breathe my essence in for a few minutes. Just keep breathing it in. And all of a sudden, a huge waft of very potent orange smell from the oils and the essence of the tree. I don't know if you've ever been around an orange tree when it's blossoming. It's got a beautiful fragrance. And the tree released this massive barrage of orange and I was breathing it in and then all of a sudden I could look at the sun like it was the first hour of sunlight or the last hour of sunlight which is what I do in Egyptian sun gazing practice and it didn't bother my eyes at all and so there's one simple example of something that I learned just by connecting my consciousness to a plant or to a tree in a tree in this case a tree but people forget that we have what we call junk DNA, what they call junk DNA is actually the genes of almost every single thing in nature. We've got 18% of the genes of a, a daffodil. We've got 23% of the genes of a fruit, of a, of a banana. We've got, I mean, when you start looking at the research on genetics, we have everything around us inside of us because we're the evolutionary tip of the sword of life. So when, when you start really getting into deep meditative and spiritual development practices and shamanic practices, and allow your consciousness to guide you and the wisdom of your soul to guide you, you find that we're really 
part of everything in nature and that we're in a co-creative relationship. But when we get too caught in ideas and belief systems, we think we're conscious, but we're trapped into the intellectual realm and we fall into this sort of a dark night of the soul. And unfortunately, we're killing the planet doing this stuff. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this line in the sand I've been describing. Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting story with the oranges. And uh, I've had certainly some similar uh, guides from, yeah, from mushrooms more than anything else. That's my uh, most common uh, guide of choice that's around me that uh, grows locally, you know, seasonally. Um yeah, I, I think veganism started as a conscious choice. It was my attempt to be more conscious in my food choices. And then it stopped being conscious when I stopped listening to my body. At that point, it, it stopped being a conscious choice and became a, a belief system that I was locked into that I couldn't see beyond that. I wouldn't listen to someone's opinion outside of that realm. Um, it's it's a bit of a, a false summit or a, a dead end kind of thing for a lot of people. I think with a lot of... I see a lot of athletes come out of it quite quietly, but they'll step out of it. I see a lot of spiritual people now starting to get more into like um, eating liver and kidneys and, you know, the the organ meats, which are full of dense nutrition. I see a lot yeah. of people going that way now. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough... I see, and the thing is, a lot of vegans now that are coming out of it, there's been a real shift. I, I'm not on the surface, I'm one of the few that sort of made it into the mainstream news, but within the community on YouTube, there's a massive shift of vegan YouTubers with millions of subscribers, six years in, five years in, coming out as not vegan anymore for health reasons because they tried everything. They, they've they managed to step out of it. They've stayed beyond what is going on and, and they come out publicly and there are a lot of people that probably aren't coming out publicly, but a lot of them are ending up because they've gone so far into veganism, into raw veganism with all these uh, digestion issues from from overconsumption, like I say, from never satiated, never satiated, from fungal overgrowth, from too much carbohydrates, and a lot of them are going carnivore and feeling. I, I don't think it solves anything, but it re- it's like fasting, but you have fuel, so you have the energy from the the food short term, like keto, or long term, like keto. But then you're not getting any of the symptoms that you get from digesting plant food because it seems as though animal flesh, animal products digest a lot easier in a way, which is something I never thought of or believed as a vegan. But but since reintroducing it, I find they digest a lot better and I get a lot less bloating. So interestingly and ironically, the vegan movement is creating a lot of carnivores. A lot of you see that that community on YouTube. A lot of them had tried veganism because they were searching for something, some health uh, relief and they found it in carnivore through veganism after doing a lot of damage there. And so it's, it's crazy what the universe is doing from one side to another. And it's like the vegan movement came to counteract factory farming, but then the ego got too involved and it's grown to this mass entity. And it's so commercial nowadays. And there's so much Ben and Jerry's making vegan ice creams that it's, it's not to do with the original idea of why we went vegan to help the planet, to help our health and to help the animals, you know? And so it's, it's so interesting what is happening. And I just, I one of the reasons I spoke publicly because I don't want other people to, if, I want other people to realize before it took me going through a 35 day water fast and six years in to realize if that can be anything for people, if they're getting symptoms like I had, try something else earlier, try to step out of the ism sooner. And, and that is sort of why I speak because no one wants to be carnivore. That doesn't help anything either. Um, not that it's necessarily any less ethical if you're buying local uh, meat as opposed to processed vegan food, you know, it, but it, it, have you seen that movement growing? And what are your thoughts on something like that right now? I'd be, I'd be fascinated to hear that, Paul. On which aspect of it? The fact that there are so many vegans becoming meat eaters? Of becoming meat eaters, but even the carnivore movement itself, because it seems to relieve symptoms that, that plant foods seem to give a lot of people. It's sort of ketogenic in a way, and the, the, the animal foods seem to digest and, and just a lot easier. Well... I know, I know you don't want that as a, I don't want that as a solution for anything, but it's just, no, 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 no. Listen, I get it. I, I, I look, I've been doing this for 35 years and I've researched this stuff inside out and backwards because I come face to face with this all over the world in my lectures with patients. And there's nothing more draining than a vegan or a vegetarian patient who comes to you because they're sick. And then when you 
try to encourage them to eat flesh foods, they sit there and give you a long lecture about how fantastic their philosophy is. And I sit there and look at them and say, do you realize right now you're paying me $750 an hour because you're sick and you're wasting your time and money trying to defend the very philosophy that just got you a disease? Yeah. So uh, there's the <laughs> ism. Uh, that we, we'll get into a little bit of that in a bit. Yeah. But there's a couple of things I want to share with you. Uh, one, I will address your question. Consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. Meditate on that. Consciousness is a psychic substance, which means it's tangibly real. You know you're conscious. You're listening to me right now. It's real. Produced not blindly. You got to pay attention. You can't just do what everybody else is doing without asking, is it working for me? In living awareness of opposites, plant, animal, day, night, right, wrong, inside, outside, north, south, east, west. You can't be conscious without polar opposites, which are complementary opposites. So what you're describing is that the community is now making a pendular swing because everything perceptible in the universe is the expression of vibration or a wave function. That's what the Hindu symbol Om means. Are you familiar with the symbol? You must be. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what the meaning of A-U-M underscore is? I do it at the start and end of yoga practice and my meditation sometimes, <laughs> the the sound of the universe, the vibration, but no, I'd love to hear a... Uh, ah, uh, A, A in Om, Ah uh, means I awaken. U means I'm dreaming. Your life is the dream you're living right now. You are God experiencing the dream of life. <laughs> We're the entire of creation is God dreaming. So your life, this is why the first thing I do when I work with patients is identify what their dream goal or objective is. I quote psychologist Jerry Wesh, who says, when you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. Most people are working for money, not working for love. And that's the fastest way to get yourself into a crisis. And that's the prostitute archetype right there. So what's happening is the pendulum swinging the other way. I mean, if you go vegan and vegetarian and you start getting health problems, well, yes, you can fast like you did, but you still didn't get the resources your body means, needs. But what you did get is a good clean out. You did give yourself a chance to catch up. You did give your cells a break. You did give your immune system time to rebuild itself. You did have time to do a lot of deep healing. But the core resources that you needed to meet your genetic requirements, right? If you're English, you come from a region of the world where the ground freezes in the wintertime. And remember this simple rule, plants don't grow in ice. So when we have genetics and come from gene lines that require flesh for our survival, people forget that the body and the environment are expressions of each other. Humans think everything outside of them is just an object that they can use for their own pleasure or destruction, but they don't realize that we are a product of the earth. Everything in you, everything about you is directly a product of the earth. So the point that I'm making is we are conditioned by the environment to survive and thrive in the environment because human beings are the earth expressing itself, becoming more conscious of its potentials. So. Our genetics are an expression of our environment, and you can see this very clearly by studying native the history of native diets all over the world. For example, inland aboriginals have a diet that's about 75 to 90 percent plant-based and only about 10 to 25 percent animal-based because there's hardly any animal to eat out there. That's why they eat widgety grubs and insects. But if you take the same culture and go to the coastline, their diet flips over to 75% animal food and only about 25% plant food because of availability. And Weston Price, who searched the world for a healthy vegetarian tribe, and every time he found a vegetarian tribe, he found a nearby tribe that was eating flesh foods that was healthier based on his own scientific investigations. 
So what you see is that without going through all the cultures in the world, if you, for example, if you go to the Eskimo people, the Inuit, their diet is 90% uh, fat and protein and only 10% plants because plants don't grow on ice and they get most of their plant food in the winter months by cutting open the stomachs of the seals and the other creatures they catch and take the plant foods out of them and eat them right out of the stomach of the animals that they catch. So what I'm describing to you is that the pendulum is swinging just like you ultimately to balance yourself had to go back to eating flesh to get the resources that your gen your genes demand of the body. You're wearing a body that has requirements. And when you, when you learn to listen to it, it will tell you exactly what you need. Like I said, in my own research on myself, which is the basis of all my teachings, I found that the way I exercise can have a radical influence on what I eat. And, and then when I'm resting, my body can shift all the way to vegetarian. And some days I just fast because my body wants a break from food. Now, one of the things that you said I wanted to help give you some insights on, you were talking about feeling that the uh, animal foods were easier to digest, but that's actually not really the case. Uh, if you look at Steiner's work, he shows you that the more membranes there is in any creature, the higher the consciousness of it. So I don't know if you've ever looked at an anatomy book, for example, and seen that if you look at the human body, there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of membranes. So think of a shaman's drum. Each membrane on a cell is like a drum skin on a shaman's drum, and vibration hits it. And we are picking up cosmic information all the time, the energy of the sun. Think of when the sunlight hits your skin, how beautiful that is, especially in the springtime after a winter of darkness. So the energy of the sun, the photons hit your skin and they literally produce a vibration that was picked up and helps form consciousness within us. Our heartbeat, our respiratory rate. As I said, there's 30 billion billion biochemical reactions in the body a second. And if you study the science of the ethers, all, all the fluids in our body act on the tone ether. So wherever there's a chemical reaction, there's a vibration produced, and that produces consciousness of a certain type that's used by different systems and cells in the body that we call subconscious or unconscious, but it's it's what's regulating our systems. So whenever you, the more developed the animal you eat, the more work it is for the digestive system to break it down. But if you think of something like a watermelon or uh, a pea, I mean, if you were to dissect that, the number of membranes in that compared to a piece of salmon or a piece of beef is, is minimal. The difference is, is that our enzyme profiles and what our body can digest is based on our genetics and our cells produce the enzymes that are ideal for the foods that we're wired to eat by our genes, which are the influence of our environment. So what happens is that you take a lot of people and put them on a raw food diet and they cannot digest that food because they don't have the mechanisms to do it. And I've tried starting people slowly. I've even experimented with myself, but there's only so much raw food I can eat before I start getting a backlash from my body. And natives all over the world since the beginning of fire found that cooking foods, particularly high fiber foods, increases the nutrition and the bioavailability of the food. So really, what I'm pointing out here is that depending on how depleted our enzyme systems are, if our enzyme systems are depleted, then we have to find the foods which our bodies will guide us right to, and I teach people how to do this, that will have the enzymes that we need. Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, who was a biochemist and a student of Rudolf Steiner, who is the first actual biochemist in the United States, found that the average person's was enzyme depleted by the age of 32 to 35 because they'd been eating so much processed foods that they'd depleted all their enzyme systems and weren't returning enzymes into the system and they would have a collapse of their digestive ability. And by the way, he presented that information in 1957 in lectures at the University of Texas, which I have recordings of. He also found that by about the age of 32 to 35, most people's liver function was decreased to that of a 75-year-old. 
due to all the toxicity in the environment. Now, if that was 1957, imagine what the hell's going on right now. Yeah, wow. Crazy. So in summary, what I'm saying is what we can digest efficiently is based on what our genetics require and that our body has enzyme systems and metabolic processes to break down. But overeating anything produces problems for the body. If an Eskimo overeats fat, it will cause problems. If a vegetarian who comes from India in a place where they've been vegetarians for a thousand years because of a lack of availability eats too much vegetables or fruit, it will cause problems. If a carnivore eats too much meat, it will cause problems. And if you look at this from a very simple perspective, I'm a mechanic. I used to race my own drag cars, stock cars, build my own engines. I was sponsored by Honda as a motocross racer. So I have a long background in automotive, uh, in the automotive industry. And, and I understand internal combustion engines very well as a mechanic. But if you just think of the fact that inside of an engine, you have an air fuel ratio. Think of the air like carbohydrate. Think of the fuel like fat and protein. If you have too much fuel going into an engine, it'll drown the spark and the engine will just crap out and die. If you have too much air going into the engine relative to fuel, it'll actually get, the ignition will get hotter and hotter till it burns a hole right through a piston. It looks like someone drilled a hole through the piston. But what happens is some guys that race cars will lean the engine out a little bit because there's a certain period there where it will actually be a little bit more efficient, but it eats. It heats the engine up, but if you push that too far, it actually starts burning a hole through the piston. So the metaphor that I'm giving you, which can also be a campfire, wet logs are like fat and protein, and kindling is like carbohydrate. If you try to start a fire with a match, but you got a wet log, you'll never do it. But if you have some kindling or carbohydrate, you'll be able to light that log if you have just the right amount of kindling to burn the water off and ignite the wood. So every one of us is has the opportunity to listen constantly to the symptoms and the messages and our emotions and our intuition and our instinct, and we will be guided to the right metaphorical air fuel or kindling wet log mixture. And when we get it right, we think well, we recover well, we put muscle mass on if we're doing the right kind of training, our sexual performance in, is enhanced. Our digestive and eliminative abilities are enhanced, and that's why I show right in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. You can learn to read your own poops and get a lot of very valuable information. People, for example, that eat too much flesh food often have dark, foul-smelling poop that sinks. If they're eating too much fat, the poop tends to start to get to more of a whitish, grayish, or even sandy, light sandy color, and you can hardly flush it down because the, flat, the fat makes the poop float. But if, if you get the right mix of plant and animal foods for your body, you'll have these beautiful, brown, well-formed poops, easy to pass, that float. And a good poop should float because that means you've got just the right amount of carbohydrate in it. And they don't smell. They smell just like organic soil. They smell earthy, not toxic. But if you walk into a public bathroom, uh, so I'll tell you what, you need a gas mask in half the damn places. You go to the airport and it'll almost kill you. So the, do you see that what I'm sharing with you is that we're really products of the environment and our bodies are trying to guide us, which is what yours did. And congratulations for listening. Yeah, thanks for that. That was a really great analogy with the the kindling and the, the wet wood. I think that's a, uh, that really makes it make a lot of sense. And your metabolism is the source of your acquired chi in, in Chinese medicine, there's two kinds of chi, innate chi, which is what you get handed through your gene line. If your parents and your genes are robust, then you will have a lot of innate chi. But some people come from a, a family tree where there's a lot of disease, a lot of cancer, mental illness, or feeble body structure. So they have a low level of innate chi. An acquired chi comes through breath, comes through water, comes through food, comes through movement, and comes through effective management of our mind, comes through sleep. So nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement are all sources of acquired chi or life force. 
And to the degree we don't manage breathing, thinking, and movement, nutrition, hydration, or sleep, we become deficient and we often end up seeing doctors and going on fad diet approaches. So what I've just discussed is the pendular swing of consciousness from one polarity to another, ultimately to produce an awakening that each of us has unique genetic needs and our bodies and instincts will guide us and that the metaphorical line in the sand that vegans and vegetarians make actually does not really do a lot for a guy like me to promote the level of consciousness in the group. It's really just no different than someone saying all you should eat is meat. So if people walk around like we're getting that kind of mental approach now with all the kind of car carnivore stuff, and paleo stuff, it's going, the pendulum swinging. So you see the pendulum swings inside of us, but it also swings in a social group or a culture. And I've told people for years, if you just pay attention to what your body's telling you, you wouldn't have to go from the zone diet to the Ornish diet to the South Beach diet. And what do you see? Every time someone switches to a new diet, something gets better and eventually something gets worse. So they abandon yeah. the diet and then they go to another diet. And now they're eating a bunch of meat. Oh, this feels better. And then six months later, I'm feeling shitty. Then they go to another diet. Well, if people would just pay attention and do that with every meal, the whole world would be a lot healthier and maybe I, I, a lot better off because we would be conscious enough to participate in realizing that we are an expression of nature instead of trying to play all these silly childish games. I think that is really spot on. The only Thing that spinach for you is going to be different for spinach for me if i buy from my supermarket and if you grow it organic locally i think that's the hardest part for me and i think where it might be failing for people are you familiar with dr joel wallach's work no he's essentially his is similar to what you talked about with the soil but that all of our or most of our ailments come from the fact that our soil is so depleted of minerals that the vegetables a tomato is not a tomato anymore because it's it may look like one but it's not able to get the minerals as you mentioned earlier with uh, when they're reusing it for supermarkets like you said 65 percent of uh, birds and whatever scatter well from the minerals in the soil as well it's it's going to be depleted and so there's the one thing that i've found that has actually really helped me and it's interesting because i rejected supplements when i was vegan i had the odd b12 but i really believed that the diet if it's natural it would work without supplements um, and I understand coming off that, I, I felt a lot better and I felt alive again coming back to reintroduce animal products. But there were still issues that I, I was trying to work with and heal um, digestionally, and certainly some plant foods caused me more issues. And so I, I succeeded that maybe my ego was, because we can search where our ego is blocking us, and that's maybe where the growth is to be found. It was blocking Amen. me in supplements. So, so I recognize this and i delved deep into supplement worlds and got all the supplements that i've ever, ever could find and reject and i understand before i was like you don't want, i don't want my body to become reliant on supplements because then if it didn't get the supplements it might have problems but at the same time i was having problems in the first place why not just try it so so dr joel wallach has developed um something and it's it's called longevity but essentially it's the 91 essential minerals vitamins amino acids and, and everything that you need in in a three different uh, in in three formulas, and basically, I started taking that, and that's actually one of the few things that I've noticed as as had continued uh, healing benefits. So, getting making sure I am getting my minerals and vitamins and everything in guaranteed in the day with that uh, supplement, and then I'm able to so for some reason. And I don't know if it's what you mentioned earlier about enzyme, like we run out of enzymes because we're, we're burnt. I wonder if the vegan diet really depleted me and made me. Uh, deficient in in things that it was really running me dry running my system dry as it was going on and wringing me out and so getting these nutrients all back in it might it might have some effect that i'm now able to process all the the plant foods a lot better now since adding this supplement in and, and getting everything in yes uh, there's a couple of points i'll expand on there for you and the audience listening uh one I came across, uh, if you're not a member of the British Soil Society, I would highly recommend you join because mm -hmm. they have one of the best resource libraries of soil science and things like fats, proteins, everything that we're talking about, you can find very good scientific research articles on. Everything about soil and soil health and, and vegetarian, I mean, um, commercial farm versus uh 
veg- organic farming. There's a load of ex. I, I did years of research using the British Soil Science uh, uh, Soil Association's uh, resources, but I found a study uh, actually around oh I don't know. I was around the time I was writing my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. I was doing mountains of research into all sorts of stuff. And I found a research study from England that showed at that time, which I believe was probably around 2002, that said to get the same nutrients as one head of lettuce 50 years prior. So if you went back 50 years from 2002 and measured the nutrients available in one head of lettuce, that today you would have to eat 20 heads of lettuce to get the same nutrition as one head of lettuce 50 years previously. Mm. So because of our ignorance of soil science and and falling in love with so-called science and its horseshit recommendations – Scientists are the modern prostitutes. They'll say anything for money or they'll lose their jobs. So they, they, we don't really have effective science anymore. Granted, there are great scientists out there. I don't want to be too stereotypical. But if you look at a lot of the decisions people are making about diet and lifestyle and health and everything to do with human health, it keeps getting based on science. But they forget almost all these scientists are on the payrolls of corporations that have an agenda, which is to sell you their stuff. So anytime you're you're eating stuff that does not come from a certified organic farm, you're going to be eating weak, depleted uh, food. Now, the next thing is, unless your supplements are organic from organic source materials, you are eating concentrated toxins because the, you cannot remove pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, or glyphosate from the plant. There's no way you can get them out of there. And... Uh, 99% of the supplements sold in the world, and I'm that's not an objective fact, that's an observation. Research shows only 4 to 6% of the food eaten worldwide is farmed organically. So if you just use that measure, that means almost every supplement on the shelf is coming from commercially farmed source materials, which means the nutrition in there can't be any better than the soil it was farmed on, not to mention the fact that it's loaded with farming chemicals. So you're actually poisoning yourself while trying to fix yourself. Now, the tip I want to share with regard to your supplement conversation there is that supplements are often necessary to balance the body, right? Think of driving a car. If you're having a conversation with someone you don't realize you've wandered across the line and you're heading for the ditch, you will make a very aggressive effort to pull that car back or you will go in the ditch. The metaphor being is if we get too far out of balance, sometimes we have to make a more aggressive effort by using specific supplementation, whether it be B12 or uh, various omega fatty or fatty acids or, or folic acid or whatever our body needs. And that would be an aggressive swing back onto the road toward balance. But what I teach all my patients, and I do use blood tests to identify where, what they're low on is now that we know what you're low on, let's go look in the resources that we have available to us. And I have many, many books in my library on this. So whatever fat or whatever vitamin or whatever mineral or trace mineral you're low on, I say, now let's go look and see which plants in nature carry high amounts of that. And then I say to my clients, now use the the methods I taught you muscle test or soul connection and ask your soul or your body, do you need pine nuts or do you need uh, more tomatoes or do you need more carrots for, uh, you know, B, B6 or whatever uh, or dot, 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 right? And, or do you need uh, plants that are root vegetables that have more of a specific mineral in them? And so what I do is I use this opportunity to not only provide them with high quality supplementation to bring them into balance, but I bring them into awareness of which foods carry those nutrients so they know what their body's actually been craving for a long time. But because they're so um, conditioned, research shows that the average person worldwide only eats 10 to 12 foods their entire lifetime. How's that when you consider there's about a million edible about a million animal species and 350,000 edible plants in nature and the average person only eats 10 to 12 
And interestingly, especially sharing this with you as an exercise genius, I found another research study that surveyed people to find out how many exercises they knew. Guess how many exercises the average person in society knows if you test them on the spot? Two. One. Ten to, ten to twelve. Ten to twelve. Is that like jumping jacks and press-ups or something? Whatever they can come up with. <laughs> if you just go through a shopping mall and say, show me every exercise you know, the research showed okay. that the average person only knows ten to twelve exercises and the average and a completely different research study on a completely different topic showed the average person only know only eats ten to twelve foods their entire lifetime. Oh, so yeah. when you when you look at a guy like you who's into primal movement and and you know by the way, I used to be the I set the military record in two military posts for the obstacle course, which is very much like ninja warrior stuff. It's yes. very much the same that's probably where they got the concept actually. Yeah. And so I'm totally hip to that environment. I used to thrive in it. But imagine if I said to you, Tim, you're only allowed to do ten to twelve exercises and I want you to win the world championships in free running, how would you respond to that? Yeah, who wouldn't? It wouldn't I mean yeah, maybe for, it wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't happen for free running though. No. You need to be creative and uh, playful. Right. And if you look at the dynamics of the human body and its survival in nature, which is what my primal pattern system system's based on, you have to be able to move in as many as a, a ways as an environment demands of you for your own survival, which is a myriad, which is one of the reasons we have such a complex nervous system. So does that help? Do you understand? How do you feel about my explanation on the supplements there? Yeah, that's, that's spot on. I, I like that. Yeah, so use them to get back on track, but then sort of identify how you can continue with them in nature. And also pay attention to the symptoms that you had that led you to needing the minerals or the vitamins or the hormones, because those symptoms turn out to be the voice of the body requesting the foods that those supplements come from. Mm -hmm. And so the next time you have, let's say a headache or you wake up feeling lethargic for five days in a row or whatever, you say, ah, I know what this means. It means I need to eat more or drink more of such and such. And that's what my body's talking to me. And ultimately you see, as we've evolved, you know, theoretically evolved out of nature and up higher and higher, First, we came through the archaic, which was where we were fused with nature. Then consciousness grew to the magical level. Then we grew to the mythical level. So that the, if you look at art, for example, from the history period of time when we were at the magical level of consciousness, they often drew pictures of people with no mouth because survival at that level was based on largely on what you could hear. So we were very, very ear oriented. Then when we got to the magical level, uh, which are the mythical level, which is when we started telling each other stories about what lightning is and thunder is and, and what the gods are. Then you start seeing in the pictures of art that they had mouths. And so that level of consciousness is associated with the spoken word or language. And so all of a sudden you see the art changing. Then we go from the, from that level that we went from the archaic to the magic to the mythical. Then we go into what's in Gebser's theory uh, of consciousness is called the mental level. And now we're peaking out the mental level and we're going into what's called the integral level, which is the integration of all of these. And the mental level is associated with the eye because we, our brains communicate largely in images. There's nothing that I can say to you that doesn't produce an image. Children have been shown through research to produce images from the time they come out of the womb but they don't learn language for quite some time. So our mental level of consciousness is very based on, on the eyes and on images. And now we're moving into the integral stage of consciousness where we learn to integrate the body, the archaic, the ear, the magic, the mouth, the mythic, the eye, the mental into one holistic integrated system of conscious awareness which allows us to be aware of everything we're talking about and become citizens of the world, as opposed to thinking that the world is just some destination and that we've come here from a Christian fall and that we're all sinners toiling in the fields 
for the rest of our lives to realize that we're actually the earth and the cosmos itself in a co-creative relationship with itself. Damn. <laughs> Spot on, man. Well, you know, this has been my own life's research, and, and this is what I do with people because, look, the, 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 when we go to the doctor or the therapist, our culture has this idea that we're going for treatment. Don't we normally think we're going to go to the doctor or therapist for treatment? Yeah, sort of what put me off from going to them. I feel okay, like so I, if I say, yeah, if I say, Tim, I'm treating you to dinner tonight, who do you automatically assume is paying? Yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, so when we go to doctors and therapists for treatment and we pay them because <laughs> of the structure of our language and our belief system, we think all we got to do is lay there and, and because we paid them, they're going to take our problems away. So what yeah. happens is we, we medicate our symptoms and we turn over the responsibility of our body to other people because we're not adult enough to pay attention and we're not spiritually evolved enough to worship and realize that the temple that we're in is the body and it is the only place we can realize who and what we really are. So I teach all my practitioners that we don't treat the person that has acquired a disease. We coach the person so that they realize how they got it and how they can prevent it in the future. In other words, we don't treat the disease that has the person. We coach the person that's acquired the disease. And so And that's that, not that's one of the, sorry to, to go in there, but that's one of the reasons I got here. I got so rejected by the vegan community is because I did these practices on my own. I I believed I I believed in my own empowerment that I could solve it for myself if I followed my, the right guide and I did that and that my answers shocked the community in a way because my answer is that the diet is at, at fault but what they in turn did was blamed all of my practices they blamed raw veganism they blamed uh, fasting massively blamed fasting and they blamed urine therapy now as the person that lived those experiences I know what each of them did and I only did them because I was desperate for answers and because I was already suffering. But it's it's been amazing to witness the the blindness of which they will receive this information because they, ultimately they're in such denial of the, the potential that a human could fail on the diet and it be the diet's fault that it's caused such mass mayhem and why I've had to be so outspoken because I don't want these practices getting the blame. It's not their fault. It no. is the diet's fault. And so it, it is that right that I address it, I think. Well, I teach all my students there's no such thing as a bad food or a bad drug, only an incorrectly prescribed food, drug, or exercise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this is all fascinating. And, and I want to say I'm really proud of you for the journey you've been on and for you've really been on the hero's journey. And, and you know, the, hero, the hero's journey is really about a departure from the consensus normal. I don't know how much study you've done of shamanism, but shaman never live with the tribe. They always live outside of the tribe so that people don't assume them. When the shaman lives with the tribe, they lose their magic because people think they're just another guy. Wow. So but, interesting. So, they, so interesting. Yeah. So what I'm telling you is you are in your own shamanic initiation and spirit is putting you in a situation where you are being differentiated out of the social consciousness or the consensus uh, norm, the, the average, right? But remember, Carl Jung said the average man can never be successful. And in order for you to truly become the healer and the teacher and the guide that you're meant to be, spirit is guiding you into the psychological growth and the individuation of yourself, which requires that you separate from the herd mentality and the ism is the herd mentality. Um, I'm, I would love it if you could share a little bit, what were some of the kind of reactions that you got when you announced this? Because from what I could read, I went to one of your websites. I don't know if you noticed, but I left you a comment there. Um, but I went to, I think it was a Facebook forum or something where people just were tearing you a brand new butthole, for being honest. And I left a comment there to try to awaken some of them and celebrated with you. But what were some of the reactions that you got? I'm sure they weren't too uh, friendly. 
Yeah, I, I, I get a lot of people saying I was fake. I was only vegan sort of for business or something like that or for the money. And it was like when I got into it, it was really not that popular. It wasn't – I when I got into it and it became a career for me, like with my clothing company – I made less money. I sacrificed my athletic career because physically I wasn't as capable and I was committed to the, the, the vegan message and animal rights. So I got called a phony and a fake. Um, people think that I never cared. People's telling, saying that I'm not ethical anymore. And it's like my ethics, I've had to recalibrate because of course it's quite an identity crisis to have your beliefs be there and then come out of it. But I'm in no way see myself as, as less ethical or more immoral. I think it was a great test of my integrity to be, to be honest. And it was somewhat of a social suicide, a, a social death shinobi style took myself out rather than, yeah, I could have gone silently into the night or, or kept it quiet or something. But I, I, I like to see where the fear is. I see where the fear is and I tried to turn into it. And, you know, I went on national TV in, in the UK and spoke publicly to, somewhat blame the diet and the TV show sort of turned it into, made it about me rather than the diet because the popular consensus now is that a vegan diet is of course healthy long-term. Um, and that got major backlash. And I, I recently did a, a commercial with Vivo, which is uh, the minimal shoe company. You might know them. I've seen you wear Vibrams. Yeah. I think. yeah. So Vivo is a pretty, a pretty, I, I really like what they do. And we collaborated on a, a photo shoot in Madeira and they posted it on their, social media and Instagram. And then once the vegans got hold of it, um, they started attacking it. And then I think they probably shared it. Say, so there's like sort of an attack on me now. So if I appear on somewhere popular, they'll just go in there, share it amongst themselves and get everyone to go in and sort of attack me and attack my character and, and everything, man. And it, it's been great in the sense that it's helped me just, to know, I'm the only the only validation I need is my own, you know, and to really strip down, strip all the respect that that my ego was satisfied with from that community to be gone. It's given me a chance to have a fresh start. So I have moments of of a sort of sadness when I see this stuff, but then there's moments of of complete freedom on the other side of that. So it's been amazing to witness. I also the moment which I realised I would have to sacrifice everything. I I did laugh for ten minutes straight. I, the universe does like to play jokes on us and what bigger joke than me to, to build my life in that world and then to realize that it, I was wrong all along, you know? So I had to laugh about it. It's all I could do. Um, well, I would just reframe that. You weren't yeah. wrong. Yeah. You were right while it was working. Yeah. Okay. My, you know, I don't know. Do you know who Laird Hamilton is? I know the name. The surfer? Laird Hamilton's, he's the, he's surfed the biggest waves in the world. Yeah. He's probably considered the best surfer in the world. He's been a client of mine for 15, maybe 18 years. So is his wife, Gabrielle Reese. And mm -hmm. Laird's a good buddy of mine. La La One time I said to Laird, just in conversation, Laird, how would you define the truth? And Laird said, the truth is what works. Meditate <laughs> on that. Is, there yeah. was obviously a time that being a vegan was working for you or you probably mm. wouldn't have done it. And while it was working, you were a vegan. But now, you know, as should all vegans, hopefully paying attention and listening. But most vegans won't listen because they're like fundamentalist Christians. They they're so full of their dogma that they actually think everybody is attacking their dogma when really sometimes God shows up in mysterious ways. And so. Mm. You just carry the you just carry the responsibility of being the the truth bringer. And in, in tarot, you'd be the hermit who come down the mountain from deep inner exploration. And the lantern that the tarot uh, hermit on the tarot holds in his hand is the lantern of the consciousness of enlightenment. But the weight of knowledge is so much if we don't come down the mountain and share it with the people that down below us that haven't learned these things yet, the weight of knowledge can, can torture us, which is why I do what I do. It's impossible for me to watch all the people in the world suffering and trapped in all their silliness and not do my best to help them. And I, too, have been attacked constantly when I enter. You know, I'm the guy that introduced Swiss balls to the exercise industry prior to me. They were just used for rehab and, and aerobic exercise and, you know, what we call jumpy bumpy. 
but I developed the entire concept of using Swiss balls in the gym and developing strength and developed the first videos on Swiss ball for rehabilitation, Swiss ball for athletes. I developed the first conditions on uh, videos on spinal conditioning. And, and, and this was 1988 when I started. And I got attacked everywhere. People, bodybuilders and weightlifters called me a fag and a pussy. And, uh, you know, you should have seen the backlash I got. But I've, I've been through this over and over and over again. That's why I told you right at the beginning, you can tell who the pioneers are because they have arrows in their back. But that's just <laughs> Einstein said. This is a beautiful quote from Einstein. I have a huge poster of this on the wall in my library. Great minds always meet violent opposition from medi mediocre minds. And it's just a fact. And, and I don't know if you've ever watched the Genius series on, on Amazon, but they, they have a series on Picasso and a series on Einstein. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I'll, I'll check them out, man. I, I, I do acknowledge that I think when I spoke my truth at the time, it was for the, it, it did help somewhat a rising consciousness for some people. And it stirred things up at the time. When I first went vegan, it stirred things up, but it helped. Veganism, veganism is initially a rise in consciousness. But then this new truth, it's like the first time we do anything isn't necessarily the right time, but it was a good first effort. So as we revisit these ethics and morals and our relationship to the earth and what's best for it and for our health, I think once again, it is stirring shit up, but it is for a rise in consciousness overall as, as it helps someone who's been so deeply ingrained in the root of that community to speak out, I think it can help because there's only so much someone on, on the outside can speak and anyone hear it. Whereas to stir things up, it was sort of a, a the universe planted me in there for a reason in, in the middle of the house of cards, you know? Well, there's a couple things I want to share with you and, and the audience. One, as you know, veganism is now a multi-billion dollar industry. So the reason they probably re restructured your television interview to make it about you is because the amount of money being paid to advertisers and corporations for vegan based products is in the billions. So you're essentially up against a giant that uh, doesn't want someone with your power mm. negating their financial capabilities. The other thing is anytime you're feeling alone in your journey, remember that the spiritual life by definition, spirituality means connecting to a larger whole. Everything that I've been sharing with you and that you've been expressing through your own process, hasn't this brought you into a deeper awareness that the plants are conscious, that the soil is alive, that the earth is conscious, that the cosmos is awake because everything on earth depends on the sun, the stars, the moon the galaxy, there, there's nothing that's independent from anything. So my point is, your spiritual journey by now should have left you with the understanding that your brothers and sisters are everything that's alive on this planet. And when you're alone, take solace with that family, because that family loves us. Thank you, man. Yeah, I, I do a lot of walking in nature on my own, and that helps me in my own strength. And so I'll continue to do that when I, yeah, when, as a, as a healer, I do. One of the things I prescribe people is watch, go and watch three sunrises in a row. If you're feeling depressed. On the, on the, Amen. Uh, yeah. you, remember I told you, I went into a year of vegetarianism. The first practice my soul gave me is called Egyptian sun gazing. I was told yeah. to spend the first hour of sunlight and the last hour of sunlight in meditation, looking directly at the sun. And I had profound experiences. In wow. fact, I'll tell you one of them. Shoot. Just, I've, I've practiced sun gazing and that's another thing I got ridiculed for by the vegan community. So yeah, go on, share it with us. Well, I, I was meditating in the sun and this is probably about a month in and this being appeared to me. It came in through the light and it kind of shocked me at first because it looked like I would imagine Jesus Christ would look, but he was this being was a Middle Eastern looking man, about 35 years old, very beautiful man, wearing uh, beautiful robes that were kind of decorated almost like uh, African or maybe Rastafarian with a lot of fine weave and kind of a mix of many cultures, but just just very beautiful. And, and, and this being was speaking to me. 
And I said, who are you? He said, I am the spirit of the sun. And I said, do you mean the consciousness of the sun? He said, yes, I am the consciousness of the sun. I am the father relative to earth, the mother. I am the source of fecundity. I am what you are growing toward. And I said, you know, I've always believed that everything has a spirit. And, I, and I've experienced this because I'm clairvoyant. So I see nature spirits and things like this and people in the afterlife and whatever. So this wasn't a shock for me, but I was, it was the first time that the sun had approached me as a being of consciousness. So I said to this being, I said, do you have a name? And he said, yes, my name is Umbakara. And he, I said, can you spell that for me? And he, and he spelt it. And so then I said to my soul right there in the conversation, do I have any books in my library that might tell me about Umbakara so I know I'm not just hallucinating right now? And my soul said, yes, you do. So I teach a system of how to communicate with the soul, which I think you'd be fascinated. In fact, I will be happy to give you my online program titled Primal Pattern Eating as a gift of love and appreciation for you being your perfect self. I and, love that. Uh, Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. So anyhow, I said to my soul, once I finished the meditation, can you show me where this book is? My 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 soul guided me to right into my library, three shelves in, turn right, second shelf down, a very comprehensive book on theosophy, which is the system created by Madame Blavatsky, which Rudolf Steiner initially was part of. I said, what page is it? I think it was page 435, right there in bold letters, Umbakara, the spirit of the sun, known to many cultures as the consciousness or spirit of the sun. And I got electrified. All my meridians lit up, but I knew I had just encountered. And since then, I regularly communicate with the sun. And so that was one of the reasons that my soul directed me to the Egyptian sun gazing practice was to be able to actually realize that the sun is conscious and the sun, the consciousness of the sun can give us answers to questions that we have about things that relate to the solar function or the overall function. In other words, there's certain things that are more appropriately asked to our own soul, such as, should I marry this person? Should I buy this house? Should I eat this food? You don't want to bother Umbakara with, you know, is my poop looking good today? But if you want to ask a deeper question <laughs> about what's going on here, then go ahead. But the other thing that I wanted to share, which is I, I think is a real important element to this conversation, this is what I tell vegetarians, because almost every one of them, vegetarians and vegans that I've ever counseled, and there's been a lot of them, as you can imagine, I have over 10,000 students around the world, and a lot of them came into my system as a vegan or a vegetarian and struggled with the concept of listening to your body and eating flesh. I say, what's so hard about listening to your damn body? If you don't trust your own body, you're already screwed, glued, and tattooed before you even get started. <laughs> yeah. But I said to them, look, if you study the human body, and there's great books like At Home in the Universe by Rudolf Steiner, Man, Universe, Earth, and Man by Rudolf Steiner, and many others I could cite. But if you study the human body, you'll find that our organs and our glands function exactly on the laws of the plants. They literally live and function as plants within us. And lo and behold, when people used to lose brain function, they called them a vegetable, didn't they? Yeah. And if you look at the autonomic nervous system, in medical books prior to about 1960, it wasn't called the autonomic nervous system. It was called the vegetative nervous system. Because we have the plant kingdom within us, the plant kingdom has much more growth, repair, and regeneration capacity than the animal kingdom does. In other words, if you break a branch off of a plant, it can grow it back. But if you lose your arm, it won't grow back. So the plant kingdom and plant foods have much more growth and regenerative power because they have those abilities. And our glands and organs are what do the regeneration of our animal body. And the reptilian brain in the Paul McLean's triune brain system is the vegetative system. It's what regulates our autonomic system. The mammalian brain, which is the home of the limbic system, 
begins with our evolution through the mammalian kingdom. And so there you see the musculoskeletal system is the outgrowth of the animal kingdom if you follow the evolution of species on Earth. And then you get to the human kingdom and the human neocortex, which is the first time we actually act against our instincts. The, the neocortex allows us to be creative and have novel ideas, but it also allows us to ignore our instincts and our intuition and work against ourselves. So the problem with the human being is it has a powerful enough brain, which allows it to access higher levels of consciousness that give it tools and, and concepts that may or may not be life affirmative. And by definition, a moral is a code of conduct that is life affirmative. An ethic is simply a code of conduct that may or may not be life affirmative. And I mentioned that because you mentioned the ethics and morals in, in involved in this vegan and vegetarian movement. But what I'm getting to is, and this is what I tell my students, look, plants and animals don't vote. I've never seen a bear light a forest fire. I've never seen plants and animals purposely destroy their environment like human beings do. They don't build nuclear weapons. They don't do genocide. You can look at myriads and mountains and mountains of research. For example, what happened when they put wolves back into uh, what park was that? Yosemite. Uh, Yosemite, right? They balanced the entire ecosystem out when they stopped killing off all the wolves and reintroduced them back into the environment. So you see that that's a moral. The wolves kill what they need to kill to balance the system. And that's really what human beings should be doing is using higher consciousness to balance things so that our children have a greater chance of thriving instead of being full of glyphosate, mercury, and poisons and vaccines that are supposed to help you but are actually more dangerous than the damn uh viruses and bugs are supposed to be protecting you against. So the point I'm making is I tell my students, if you are not taking care of yourself and listening to your body and eating the food you need and trying to be conscious not to overeat or undereat so you're not destructive to nature or destructive to yourself, but if you're not doing those things and you get caught in an ism and you end up sick, you're practicing animal cruelty at the highest level. And I say the highest level, not to be hierarchical and disrespectful to the animals, but the animals don't vote. The animals can't change what's happening in their environment. They don't build bulldozers and they don't build factories and they don't tear down forests to build shopping malls. So I teach all my students to the degree that you're a real Czech professional, your mission on this planet is to love, nurture and care for yourself to achieve the highest level of consciousness and spiritual integration so that your life becomes a living example of what's possible as a human being so that we can all work together to protect the animals and the plants and the beings of the soil that are the foundation of our very existence so that we can all evolve together because we couldn't be here without them and we're on the edge of a precipice of death right now with the sixth mass, mass extinction. And there's a great book written by Edward O. Wilson, a famous naturalist. Um, and I think it's called A Letter to a Pastor. I can't remember. But he, he basically shows you how much, how many animal species human beings have destroyed and, and put into extinction. And it's absolutely clear that we are acting out of our so-called hubris and our religious programming to think that this world is just some kind of a way station that we stop at on the way to heaven and we can do whatever the hell we want with it while forgetting that we are this world and that everything outside of us re is represented inside of us. And to the degree that we come into contact with what's inside of us, we come to realize the beauty and the perfection of the world around us. Yeah, I'll breathe to that. Now, one of the things I wanted to highlight here, you know, the whole concept of an ism, having studied psychology extensively for a long time and, and looked into these issues, isms typically appear whenever a culture's myth is breaking down. 
whenever you see a tribal myth, for example, look what happened when they put Native American Indians on reservations, took them out of round tents, put them in square buildings, and forced them to eat processed foods. Well, they became, they had serious problems with alcohol. They started smoking a lot of cigarettes, toxic cigarettes that poisoned them. They started getting cancer. When Weston Price traveled around the world in 1938, and in that era, many native tribes didn't even have a word for cancer or some of the diseases that white men knew. As soon as they started eating white men's food, which they often got from trappers coming into the area, they started getting sick. He showed that their entire uh, bone structure, their teeth all changed and started to deteriorate. So basically what you find is whenever any tribe or culture loses its guiding myth that there is a breakdown, a psychological breakdown and a breakdown with how they interface with nature. And, and I'm curious, how do you, what's your thoughts, if you have any, on the isms in general, not just veganism and vegetarianism, but for example, you look at, at uh, you know, when Germany lost its way and Hitler took over and people became unconscious and they tried to take over the world, which led to a third world war. You look at Jim Jones and how he got people to poison themselves. You look at Groups like the KKK and the skinhead, these are examples of isms, of people that have lost their sense of connection to each other in the world and then come out with some kind of a, a very aggressive behavior that really turns out to be a, a group social pathology. Um, if you had a message for the vegetarianisms and the veganisms at this point in your life, well, first of all, what do you think the myth that's been lost is? I think the myth is is we're so removed from our ancestors. And so when I grew up and I did, wasn't aware of the process of that, like I was aware on the surface, but I wasn't like taken to an animal slaughterhouse. Like our, our parents and our grandparents went through world war and it must have been a lot easier to program them. And there might be something in the water that's, that's given them dementia or in the food that they've, they've adapted to eating. But it's somewhat, I feel like it would have been our grandparents or parents' roles in our, in our ancestry or the, to, to take us to the local farmer who would have been our greatest ally and let us see the process and, and develop a mature relationship to the whole thing. Now, because we weren't aware of it growing up and then we came to encounter of it in our twenties or whatever, it was a shock to us to see the process and in, in an immature state, we locked ourselves out of it, you know, through watching Disney movies with uh, rabbits and ducks and Peppa Pig and stuff. We've got our relationship to animals is, is a, a different one to what it would have been in the past. And so I've had to sort of parent myself and grow myself up into a, the acceptance of this. And it has been a, a growing up. And I think that's been the, the, what's been lost is that we would have had a better relationship to the farmer, to our local communities and, and not just a supermarket. And so with the, the production of supermarkets, the growth of cities to provide for cities, factory farming is just a parallel to cities, really. It's like had to appear to provide the amount of food for cities whereas now I moved out of London and back into a, a small town in, near Derby I've got a local farm shop less than a mile down the road I, I, I look in the farmer's eyes and see that he's you know done the butcher and they're, they're, they're good humans you know and not this when, yeah. when I first went there I used to be like oh screw those guys I'm just buying the vegetables you know and, the, the, and I recognize the ego that was playing out itself in me the whole time I can see it clearly now and I can see what it's played out in other other areas of my life but it, they are not the bad people and to, to be supporting corporations because they've created a vegan product which is still mass like you said mass production rather than your local farmer to these wars i see between vegans and farmers online it's that's that sh they should be our like i say our allies and we're creating wars with the wrong people because if anything goes wrong god forbid we, we need those relationships to the local farmers you know um and I, 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 when it comes to isms, I just recognize if I was born here without, you know, things around me, I, I wouldn't form. F and, and, you know, who knows? In two years, maybe I'll be the strongest Christian. I'll never stay close to this stuff. I, I try and stay open. But it doesn't make sense for me to follow a book written by man from other humans when I can find everything inside and in nature when I take myself out there and I go and watch and I spend time. In a, in a garden and doing some gardening and with the soil and see how much we have to interact with worms and 
bugs and they, they you know you sort of have to just accept that some of them are, worms are going to get chopped in half and killed in the process of just home gardening so what do you think goes on when it comes to to bigger processes and fa- factory stage levels you know it, there's so much destruction that goes into that so i just recommend that everyone spend some time in a garden or, or out in nature and just watch what goes on because there is a process you god cannot be killed or destroyed it's, it's just flows from one thing to another and I used to say when I was sort of vegan, I used to say, like jokingly say only vegans can judge me. And now I, I sort of jokingly say only vegan gardeners can judge me because they truly understand. <laughs> they truly understand the process. You know, if someone's a vegan and a gardener and they're living it, I'm like, you know what? Much respect to you. You at least know the process. And they're, therefore they're probably not going to judge me for not being vegan because they'd have a much greater understanding of what goes into the, our food process well when they really get to be good vegan gardeners they'll understand that the plants are downstairs hunting in the earth for earthworms and parasites to eat and they'll realize that everything has to eat something else which is what the ancient symbol of the ouroboros the snake that eats its tail is telling us life has nothing to eat but itself you're in therapy and the question is <laughs> Yeah, the question is balance. If the snake overeats itself, it dies. If it undereats itself, it grows so big that it can't sustain itself. Just like, Mm. you know, research shows that if human beings reach a certain height and weight, they can't function because they can't deal with gravity effectively. And we are, we have the body size range that we do because it's demanded of us by the environment and the circumstances of physiology and physics. The Goldilocks zone, sort of. Yeah, there's that special magical zone, you know, and, and it's interesting, you know, looking at your the backlash that you got from the vegan community and and how the vegans and the vegetarians can be so aggressive against other groups. It's unbelievable. Yet at the same time, they most of them say they do this because they are against animal cruelty. Yet I watch the way they engage each other, uh, not so much each other, but other people and other groups and they're being very cruel to human beings. And mm. one time I was teaching a class in Hawaii and I had a, a, a vegetarian in the class who started arguing with me about the fact that vegans were loving people and they weren't violent and being a vegetarian made you much less violent and aggressive. And I said, I hate to tell you that, but you're brainwashed and I can prove it to you. And they said, well, how are you going to prove that to me? Well, it just turned out that I was staying about five blocks away from where the conference, where the class was being held. And on the way to to the class every day, I walked right past a vegan health food store. And so I said to my class, I bet you I can prove to you within about 30 seconds of walking into a vegan health food store how violent these people can be. Would anyone like to take me up on the bet? Well, every single student in class did. I said, okay, stand up and follow me. I took them out of the class. We walked about three blocks down. I walked in and I pretended like I was looking for something. I said, you guys just watch what happens. So I started walking around, looking around, pretending I was looking for something. And I walked over to the refrigerated area. And sure enough, the fair skinned girl behind the desk who clearly had a fungal infection and body was all swollen up pasty face looking like she had adrenal exhaustion bags under her eyes which you see when people have been vegetarian and vegan too long came over me and she said are you looking for something can i help you i said yes i can't find the bacon anywhere and she went off she just raised her voice at me and how dare you ask for bacon in a vegan store we would never kill animals and she was just ripping me a new asshole and all my students were just cracking up laughing. And she's looking at them. She goes, what is going on here? What are these people laughing about? Why is this so funny? And then I smiled and said, well, I actually brought them down here to demonstrate that within 30 seconds, I could show how violent vegans were. So thank you for your help. And we all walked <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. It's, it's like there's some, it's like the universe parallel and that there it's like rather than, going within they're pushing everything out and it's creating that loop of like they're they're carnivorous through their lack of ability to understand and cons you know they're carnivorous on humans in a way it's crazy yes now i i want to make it clear for the listeners i have just as much concern for people that are overeating meat and i've seen studies 
done in the United States suggesting that the average American eats three to five times the animal flesh they need to be healthy. Of course, 94 to 96% of that's coming from commercial farms, which animal cruelty at its highest, its toxicity at its highest. It's very, very dangerous for anybody's health, including the animals. So I, I think that uh, it's it, you, people could get the impression that I'm very anti-vegetarian or vegan. I am not, as I've tried to say. I'm all about balance, and I'm all about growing spiritually and developing our consciousness and love and appreciation for all that supports us and doing what we've got to do to be balanced, healthy, intelligent, conscious, loving people so we can evolve past all this kind of ethnocentric group warring against each other, which still goes on like crazy. And what I tell all my students is, if you want to learn how to eat less meat, I want each of you to go to a slaughter. Go to a slaughterhouse, watch animals being killed, watch them being skinned and gutted. And when you stand right there, see, I grew up on a farm. We fed ourselves off our own animals. We had, we had our own cows, our own goats, our own chicken, our own sheep. Uh, we, we basically were a self-contained farm. We sold produce. So we, you know, I'm, I, I was raised fully involved. I used to work during hunting season. I, a friend of mine, dad owned a butcher shop and I used to work skinning uh, elk, moose, deer, uh, and uh, the animals that were brought to the butcher shop for, uh, shop for uh, processing. So I spent a lot of time deeply immersed in the blood, guts, and realities of a slaughter. And we slaughtered our own animals on the farm. And, you know, I was a kid that fed the pigs every day and fed the sheep. And I developed deep friendships. And it was oftentimes very emotionally painful for, for me to see my friend, the pig that I was just riding when you know, like I was a little kid, I'd be riding the pigs like people ride horses. I would wrestle with them. I would feed them. I'd play with them. And the next thing you know, I was having them for breakfast. So I learned early on that, that life, life is uh, sometimes it's confusing and sometimes it's challenging. But I also developed an intimate, friendly relationship with animals. So this consciousness of knowing that I'm eating my friends and that, and that it should be a sacred practice was instilled in me quite early because of these experiences. And I encourage all the meat eaters to go actually not watch it on video. That's a cop out. Go stand close enough that you can get splattered with blood. Go there when you see the look in a cow's eye, when it knows it's about to die and it's scared to death. And that I've had many of my students write back to me and said, oh, Paul, I did what you said. And I'm telling you what, I don't eat near as much meat anymore because it brought me into a whole new level of reverence for what I was doing by just eating meat unconsciously. So for me, this isn't really a, about an attack on vegans or vegetarians. It's really saying it's time for all of us to realize that we're killing the planet by overconsumption and acting at low levels of consciousness. And, this, and nature cannot sustain this sort of childish teenage behavior anymore. And if we're not smart, we're going to be taking ourselves into a major crisis when the environment starts to collapse, which it's very close to now. We're killing the oceans. We're killing the rivers. We're, we're poisoning the sky. We've destroyed massive amounts of soil. I talk about this with my podcast with Dave Murphy. So, you know, I think, Tim... I think you'd agree that what we're really doing here is is it's a call to higher consciousness together, don't you think? Absolutely. I, I always said as a vegan, maybe you know people that eat meat should have have to get a meat license and kill an animal themselves. And then since eating meat myself, I've sort of I've tried to seek out an opportunity to slaughter an animal myself. And I mentioned that publicly in an interview with in a British newspaper, The Guardian. And I got again massive backlash from the vegan saying Tim now wants to kill an animal. And I said if I'm gonna do this i want to at least feel if i'm rather than pay someone else to do it and i'm not i don't think everyone should have to do it themselves but as a man i feel like if i'm going to do it i have to feel the feelings that come up in that moment as w when i kill the animal and what emotions i feel will then create a gratitude for the, for that food in the future when i eat it i will have, have, have way more emotional connection to it which will then probably in in some spiritual way give it more nutrition in the way i'm eating with more gratitude Absolutely. The fastest way to accomplish that objective is, is just 
go to a place that raises chickens and ask them if you can catch and kill your own chicken yeah and and then pluck it and gut it, uh, which I've done countless times as a kid on a farm. And the point being, you can get the same experience without having to go out and kill a deer or, okay. uh, you know, another animal. But you'll go through the same experience. I remember the first time I had to snap a chicken's neck and cut it or cut a chicken's head off. Uh, we, My father, would he taught me how to do it either way. But um, I still went through the same experience. Um, you can catch a fish and and kill it and gut it too uh you know each one of those gives you a a different experience because you 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 realize they all know they're going to die and and they're losing their life and and this is what what's missing we have all this religion but we've we've lost worship we have totally detached from the concept of worshiping and all native tribes were deeply connected to and respected and have love and reverence for. And the whole concept of sacrifice comes from giving something of ourselves back to the world. And when we when we just keep consuming and consuming and consuming, we don't really sacrifice. We are living the life of, of an eternal child that just thinks that somehow that, that nature can just forever just keep putting out like this. But I think it's time for us all to realize that we're in the we're in the temple of life on this planet and that the sacrifice that we need to make is to be more conscious and to be more respectful of nature and to eat what we need to eat to be effective co-contributors and to support the animals and don't take more than we need you know the native tribesmen typically would just like the wolves the wolves and most carnivorous animals hunt the weak. Even sharks hunt the weak. They won't go after the strongest prize buck or bull or steer or or uh, animal. They they look for the older ones or they look for the weak ones that are going to be selected out by nature anyhow. And so the and oftentimes when hunts were on, it was the shaman that would use remote viewing and would connect to the animal spirit and and offer a sacrifice to the animal and would then connect to the spirit of the animal, the oversoul of the animal and be guided to where they could find the animals. And I've got numerous books documenting how the shaman would lead the hunters right to where the animals would. And and oftentimes the animal was standing there like it was waiting for them. And this is why when the white man came and started killing off all the buffalo, it put the Native American Indians into a very deep spiritual crisis because to them that was was the most devastating thing you could do. It, would, it, was, is it, it was the equivalent of a complete and utter disrespect for God or for life because to them life and God are the same thing and, and, and to me too. So, you know, I think these are... These are important discussions, and what really attracted to me to you was your honesty and your bravery and your willingness to endure the pain of being different but being committed to your own evolution and to your own health. And and what a great message that you're able to now share and and. Hopefully you can see that this has brought you deeper into touch with nature and your own soul and and Mother Earth. Thank you so much, man. It it does mean so much coming from you, someone who helped me throughout this process, uh, listening to you speak on the the subject. And um, yeah, if if people like you seem to get it, then I guess I must be in the right realm and doing the right thing. Um, Well, you're just carrying the weight of, (laughs) of... of being an elder and being a leader. And I mean, look, everybody that's ever come with a message that's different has suffered their pains. Martin Luther King, dead. John F. Kennedy, dead. Abe Lincoln, dead. And the list is very long, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Not that I want you to get (laughs) killed, but but at the same point, you see, I'm saying that- Yeah, no, I know. This is, that's the sacrifice, right? That we- we, there's always a sacrifice that we make in order to truly become whole and to truly be a leader. Yeah, I recommend. And ultimately, yeah, and ultimately, 
really everything you're doing, it turns out to be a gift. Because as I said, a lot of the people that are rebelling against you will ultimately come back to you and thank you. And sometimes it's, look, I got a little boy. And sometimes he says, daddy, I don't like you. Daddy, go away. No, I don't want to be with you. Now, if you're, if you let yourself get emotionally disturbed by that, forget that it's a child, it could be very painful. Hmm. But when you when you realize it's just a child and, and he doesn't know how to understand or comprehend his own emotions and he's just being brutally honest with what he feels, not really knowing what it means, what he's saying, yeah. then the next thing you know, he's going, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I want to kiss yeah. you. And so, so you have to realize that people that at lower levels of consciousness are really just acting out the life of a child. And, and I, I do really comprehend that and when i'm at peace i completely see that and i'm, I'm fine with it all uh, from a s spiritual solo perspective I, I think it was confucius who said we should be uh, human-minded rather than righteous or it's better to be human-minded rather than righteous and so i recognize with the vegan thing it was maybe more righteous and so i feel like this is me being more human-minded but at the same time i wonder if it's once again me uh being righteous in trying to speak out and then understanding that people may thank me in the future, whereas there is only now. And what if I am doing this to get credit in the future rather than just be silent and let people be <laughs> rather than causing a stir and let them all discover it for themselves. So I have that dilemma in like, am, am I not present in my own life with the fact that I'm doing this to help people, but in the fact that, I mean, I'm not doing it for the credit, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it because it's, it's, it's a, uh, I, I've got way worse backlash. There's no reason for me to want to believe this to be the case and to, to step out the way I have. But it, it's just interesting. Am I projecting into the f future rather than being present with it? And, you know, there's that, that path of like, just let everyone live their life or do I speak outspoken and, and stir things up? I don't know if there's a right or wrong or if it, it, well, it's the good fight. Am I fighting the good fight, you know? Can I help you with yeah, that? Yeah, that's why I'm here. To, I'm asking you. Yeah, I'd love to know. I, I want you to pretend that you're holding a crystal ball in your hand, which you know is used for seeing into the future, I right? I can grab one off the shelf. Okay. All right. Okay. I've got a rose quartz crystal ball. Here we go. Beautiful. So now when you look into that crystal ball, mm -hmm. look into the future, and if all the vegans don't see or hear your message, Yeah or somebody like you or me, how many of them get sick unnecessarily because they weren't bring, they weren't given the gift of consciousness by someone like you that was brave enough to go through the process and listen to their inner voice. Yeah. It, it seems for the, for the earth, for the, for the earth, man, we need local omnivorous or local, whatever your body's guided to, but local is more seems to be the real movement rather than, the, the vegan movement where it's at now with the, the amount of processed commercial products. It's sustainability. So if you look into that crystal ball and you go, what, what does it look like in three years? What does it look in five years? And then at the same time, we're giving due diligence to the overconsumption of meat here. Are we not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So look into your crystal ball and say, what happens to the planet with five more years of factory farming? If no one like you or I stands up and does takes the risk of being crucified yeah. to deliver a message. Yeah. Where does that crystal ball take you? How many animals die unnecessarily? How much destruction is there in nature? We've got to keep speaking. We've got to keep speaking our truth and trust that we know what's right. And so there you stand in the middle, right? And, and, and the middle path is what Taoism is about. It's what Zen is about. Not too much, not too little. It's about worship. It's about sacrifice. Your sacrifice and the sacrifice of me and people like us is to accept that people that are less consciousness are caught in isms. They're caught in rigid belief systems. They haven't learned to pay attention to their body. They don't know enough about the science of the soil, the science of nature. And they're really just programmed by a society that's lost. And really, if you look at research into mythology, the myth of our day is consumerism. Most people, as you alluded to earlier, don't even know where the food they're eating comes from. They haven't got a clue. You mentioned Jamie Oliver. I saw in one of his shows, he was demonstrating a fact. He was had a bunch of school kids in front of him, and he had flashcards. 
and he had been surveying to see how many kids in elementary school knew common fruits, vegetables, and farm animals. And he found that 50% of children could not identify common fruits, vegetables, and farm animals, but paradoxically, 100% of them could identify common corporate symbols such as Target, Walmart, etc. Mm. So we're dealing with people that have lost touch with the earth so bad that our children don't even know what they're eating or where it comes from. And it is the sacrifice that people like you and me and many of my students and many other conscious people around the world are making that we have to endure the kids getting upset and daddy not getting a hug or a kiss from someone who once said they love them, knowing that sometimes we need pain to wake us up. And if we really love the planet and we really love nature and we love animals and plants, then we also know that we're speaking for them. We're sharing the wisdom that we've gained through our own process with others to inspire them to go out and try it for themselves. I tell my students all the time, don't believe the word I say, go try it. If it doesn't work, come back to me. I'll check your technique. So far, every single one of my students that said something didn't work when I checked them, their technique was wrong. And when I taught them, it did work. I've taught thousands of my students how to communicate with plants and trees and it blows their mind. I show them how you can find plants and trees in nature that will sh that you can learn how which ones will give you the right energetic healing. Each one of them has different energetic properties, just like each different musical instrument has different energetic properties. I show them how to connect with plants. I've even had students write books of their communications with plants and trees. We, we we're really making a sacrifice, but you know, Rumi says the greatest lover is the silent lover and the greatest teacher is the silent teacher. <laughs> and what is, Great. what is he saying? He's saying that the way we live is the message. You walk through the supermarket, people see a healthy, strong, vital person. They feel your energy field and they start watching you and studying you. The point I'm making is not that we should stop saying anything. But it's that we should all realize that to the degree that we're healthier and more whole and centered in ourselves and other people around us, our energy field harmonizes and our actions and our way of living are an example that they can choose to follow. And if we realize that, then we're teaching everywhere we go out of love by being the person that we have grown up to be and that spirit has guided us to be for the betterment of all of us. And we always keep an open mind because as much as I've studied this and I practice this and I have a deep spiritual practice every single day of my life is a practice of worship, I also leave the top of my head off because as Mark Twain said, don't let your schooling get in the way of your education. And I've learned that the more I know, the more I need to learn. And therefore, I'm in a constant state of evolution myself. So I, I try not to get dogma because really the basis of my whole system is Learn to think constructively. Yeah. Don't just do what other people tell you to do and learn to be part of the world and grow with it and keep an open mind because if you don't, then your evolution stops. On that exact note, as someone who's who I can see is open to questioning mainstream current science and understands the intelligence and connection our ancestors shared with the earth, have you looked into uh, what our ancestors believed with a, a geocentric model rather than the heliocentric model which came around in the 16th century and uh, yeah if you understand the question yeah uh, that's actually not true I mean uh, we think the heliocentric model came around the 16th century but all you got to do is study the Egyptians they worship the sun mm -hmm. we may have learned we, we only learned that the earth was rotating around the sun that's an intellectual advancement that just happens to turn out in the laws of physics to be true. But when you look at ancient cultures, many of them were highly conscious of the sun and knew of the spiritual being in the sun, which is where Egyptian sun gazing came from. Ra, the Egyptian god, is the sun god. So if you look, you know, if you want to hear something funny, 
most Christians, I've never heard of a Christian yet that actually knows what the words amen mean. Mm. You know how they end a prayer with amen? Yeah. Do you know what amen means? Uh, I thought it was, I, I know what I was guided that it's uh, the noise comes out your mouth and out of your nose. One uh, om is mouth and the N is from the nose and it's like the between the two, but that's just something I discovered. But yeah, what what is the the root of it? Amen is a shortened version of Amen Ra. Okay, it's yeah. Egyptian. It's Egyptian influence on the Christian religion, and most Christians haven't got a clue of the Egyptian influence on their own religion. Amen is worshiping the sun, mm. the god of the sun, Ra. Mm. So what I'm sharing with you is that the Copernican revolution is a mental revolution, not a spiritual revolution. But cultures long before us had deep mastery of the entire, uh, all the, look at all the temples, all the pyramids, they're all built in direct connection to the locations of constellations, Stonehenge, every bit of it. Yeah, I've seen Aboriginal hunting maps that were uh, uh, star maps that are so detailed astronomers have looked at these maps and shown now these maps were written long before telescopes and the astronomers have looked at this and concluded that a human being would have had to have had an eyeball 50 times the strength of a human eye to have been able to see these uh, uh, constellations with their physical eyes and so when you study aboriginal uh, metaphysics and abs ab aboriginal uh, shamanism and aboriginal systems of communication such as song lines they were astral travelers they were remote viewers yeah. they were not looking at them with their eyes they were traveling to these constellations in fact i am a remote viewer so I, if the point that, I, was, that we was, haven't we haven't we haven't really evolved in many ways we think we've evolved because we have scientific gadgets and we can do a lot of cool stuff with computers but if you really study the history of man, in many ways we have devolved. We still could not possibly build a pyramid. So that says it all. I, I completely agree. And if if we are in an expanding universe and everything is spinning and rotating and growing, then I just don't understand how the stars have remained exactly the same for for all all eternity that they've been mapped out. And our, many of our ancestors had a geocentric model. And I believe we have been given the tools and the mathematical mind to understand the makeup of the world as it's presented to us. And it does appear to be rather static and motionless with the, the sun and the moon rotating above our heads. And now we're, the only thing that makes us believe otherwise is things that we've been led to see from modern science rather than a, a, our own perspective of the world, which I, I made a decision several years ago to try and live in comprehension of the world as though it's been presented to me not as though how I've been taught, like you said, uh, with the Mark Twain quote, I think it was. That it, yeah, don't let your knowledge get in the yeah. way of your education. So I practice seeing the world through the eyes of uh, a blank slate and going out on mountains and looking at the ocean and going on a beach and looking at the ocean and going up a mountain and seeing how the horizon still continues to meet my eye line and, and the, the way the stars can all rotate around the North star and it's the same every single night and they don't seem to shift and move. And so that just led me to, to being open to a different understanding and a more geocentric model than the, the heliocentric model, which I was of the belief that it was more of a, a model, not to say that the, the sun isn't incredibly powerful. I just don't know that it's the center of the universe as we know it. Well, it's not the center, well, the center of the, universe, of the, the galaxy, uh, the, what is it? The Milky way solar, Our system. solar system. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we're way, we're about uh, two thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy. Um, and if you study the electric universe, I think you'd find it very fascinating. Just go on Google and search the electric universe. I've studied a lot of that stuff, and I see that they're just as confused with some of the model, but they don't seem to be able to break free from the heliocentric model. But the way they see that everything is electrically connected, and they have massive questions for Einstein and the theory of gravity, which is never been proven it's just a, a theory and a guy right. that's been who had had is a very intelligent guy but at the same time was risen to fame uh at the right time for the right people you know right so here's what i tell my students and i think i want to share this with you and the listeners many of my students come back to me and say paul 
I don't know what to believe anymore. Every time I look into an issue on whether this vitamin's good or this exercise is good or cold showers are good, you find just as many experts with equally high qualifications on both sides of the fence that disagree with Absolutely, each other. Absolutely, yeah. And you know what I say to them? What does your body say? <laughs> Listen to your body. Go on. I say, I say, that's because you're now being introduced to what Steiner called the awareness soul. The awareness soul emerges when we start questioning our beliefs honestly and not believing what everybody else says like it's fact. So when you get to the point in your life where you realize there's paradoxes and contradictions everywhere, it means that you now have to become an adult and use learn to use your own mind because what's true for one person is not true for another person, just like one man's medicine is another man's poison. Mm -hmm. So the reality of it is science itself is full of mythologies. Science itself is no different than religion. And all you got to do is study the history of the changes in science. And a good example, Rupert Sheldrake pointed that, this out. People think that the speed of light is fixed. Well, it's not. And Sheldrake addressed that. And Sheldrake's talk about the, the inadequacies of science. Yeah, the, yes, exactly. Uh, and he had a TED Talk, which they banned, but all, it backfired because millions of people watched it after that. Yeah. But the reality of it is, is that science is constantly changing its mind. The universe is expanding. It's not. Gravity is this. It's not. The speed of light is this. It's not. But then if you read the research of someone like William A. Tiller, a very famous and highly celebrated scientist who wrote the book Science and Human Transformation, which is very deep and comprehensive, he gives you the mathematical speeds of light for each of the chakra systems. And every chakra system that you go up from the root chakra up, the speed of light goes up multiple times. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what is mind? Well, mind is vibration that's moving at many, many times the speed of light. And there's actually scientific experiments showing that thought moves much faster than the speed of light. All you got to do is search the speed of thought on Google or thought versus the speed of light. Mm. But most people don't actually have the discipline to dig into these things. There's a fantastic book I'd like to recommend to you and the listeners. It's by a physicist named Claude Swanson, and it's fantastic. It's about 800 pages of research on life force. And the book is called Life Force. And, and I'll give you an example of one of the studies in there. He shows that there was a scientist, I believe he was in Japan, who wanted to test if he could identify how the acupuncture meridians in our body would respond to changes in the sun. So he worked with NASA and he took subjects and he hooked them up to sensitive uh, devices to measure the flow of energy through key meridians in their body and they simultaneously monitored the sun in real time using the information from space probes and he showed that the fluctuations in the acupuncture meridians matched the fluctuations in solar activity exactly and that there was a zero time lag between the fluctuations of the energy densities of solar flares in the sun and the changes in our meridians. So do you see there's a fundamental problem with the current scientific model that it takes eight minutes for photons to get from the sun to here moving at the speed of light when he was showing that there was an instantaneous reaction in the body of any human being he tested yeah, that as the energy on the sun changed, so did our bodies. So right away, you see, we've been conditioned to believe a lot of things that advanced research that you don't get to hear about because it goes against the scientific materialist paradigm never gets brought to the students. Yeah, I'm completely with that, that, that modern science is never finished. And that what we can comprehend and conceive with our own vessels is often, in more cases, a more important truth than what than what they can show us. And as you said, we were of this illusion that we are more evolved than we've ever been. And it's completely backwards because I think we're more idiotic than we've ever been. Our ancestors were studying the stars every night while we sit and look at our phones and Twitter. And and uh, the mob wives and baseball wives, yeah. and who's, who's fucking who. And I mean, 
it, it, you know, all of this is corporate brainwashing. Like I said, our myth is consumerism and all this stuff is paid for by large corporations. Well, I think that's is a big part of that myth is that the fact that we are the first, supposedly we're the first sort of species generation to leave this bubble and go to the moon, which we've not done in 40 years. And so that's part of this myth of we're the most advanced we've ever been. And I just think that is part of this a mirage. Well, all you got to do is study remote viewing. I'm a remote viewer. I actually won a remote viewing no contest in London, in London, in London at the field at the field conference. And Edgar Mitchell, one of the sign, one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, was the keynote speaker. There was 750 people in this remote viewing contest. It was directed by the guy that directs the CIA's remote viewing program, that which they've shut down. Well, at least they say it publicly. And I won the contest, and Matthew Walden was there with me. So was another one of my instructors, and it blew their mind because they didn't know I had these abilities. I just don't talk about it to a lot of people. But the point is I've been all over the place, and the reality of it is, is when you start looking into what the mind is, the ego creates the illusion that we have our own mind, but the reality of it there is there is only one mind. Everything in the universe is interconnected. We are inside what I call the body of God. And just like your toe knows what your head's doing and your tongue knows what your uh, hand is doing and your scalp knows what your feet are doing, there's nothing in the universe that's disconnected because it's really a being of the divine. It's really the embodiment of the divine and it is intimately connected to itself. And if you look at the work of uh, Irvin Laszlo, he shows that what we think of as empty space is 800 times more dense than steel with a, a friction coefficient of zero. So what I say to my students is I ask them this question. If you're playing pool, like at a pool table, why do you rack the balls as tightly as possible? Yeah, so when you hit them, they, they go as far as possible. Right. So you have the maximum chance of getting one of those balls into a pocket, yeah. right? Okay. So if space is 800 times more dense than steel, the balls are racked pretty damn tightly. So the question I have for you and anyone listening is, could you move any one ball in a rack that tight without affecting every ball? Yeah. Well, there you go. If you just look at the science on space alone, we're all so intimately connected. And you look in chaos theory, you get the butterfly effect showing that a, what a bee or a butterfly is doing in Africa can change the weather in Southern California. <laughs> so the point being here is that we're a lot more connected than we realize. Our education systems are way behind. The greatest spiritualists and the greatest scientists and metaphysicians are kept in the dark because it goes against the dogma. And it goes against many of the things that corporations use to make piles of money off of us, which, you know, a, a couple of quick questions before we close. I know it's getting late at night for you. So thanks for being a warrior and hanging in there with me. No I just wanted to highlight, you know, I looked at your mindful warrior program mm -hmm. and what a beautiful program. I was really impressed. And I just wanted to encourage people to go to mindful-warrior.com. Yeah and have a look at Tim's program. Um, I, I was really impressed with that. And I thought it was a great gift you are offering to the world. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks Paul. Yeah. It's amazing to see how it is somewhat following, not as a, I've not got to the detail of you with your programs yet, but it was, it was amazing for me to just try and digest a lot of what I've learned. There's so much of modern current society with training in Instagram and YouTube is about, you know, explosive, impressive tricks and muscle ups and uh, flips and stuff. And then learning that stuff and big weights. And I was guided to partly because of it was somewhat what my body could do at the time, but just more of a yin practice and what's to be gained from that, from just being able to walk upstairs, you know, skipping a step, two steps at a time, but as slow as possible and realizing how unbalanced most people become in such emotion and how you ex expected to build a strong base lifting heavy weights without getting injured if you can't even go slow and light. You know, most people can lift heavy, but they right. can't lift light. So I, I developed a practice that was somewhat some animal movements and some, some body weight movements and I did a couple of videos on YouTube, which I'm pretty proud of, of sort of why, why we hang rather than do muscle-ups and the sort of science of the foot and walking rather than 
you know, walking before we run. And it, it yeah, it, was, it really does tie in with your kind of stuff as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it's very beautiful. Um, uh, you must be familiar with the fact that I developed the concept of working in for the very same reason. I think I actually requoted that at some point. Yeah, working in rather than working out. That's exactly what it is, yeah. It's the feminine element of working out. And we're so externalized and we have this no pain, macho, go, go, go. And actually th that whole concept has scared masses of people away from exercising at all. And so I really felt that it was my spiritual responsibility to educate people to how to use movement to increase life force energy and to center their consciousness and to enhance the harmony of their heart, their brain and their uh, digestive system and their or glands and organs as a whole. And, and uh, because I, I, you know, I, I hired Master Fong Ha. I didn't hire him. He offered, he gave it to me for free, but he, he was my master and, and really brought me into a deep understanding of Tai Chi. And I studied, you know, many, many books and Chinese medicine. I went and took a course in, in medical Qigong and I practiced these things long enough to, to really become very clear on how they work in my body so that I could write the book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy from a Place of Authenticity. And having been a consultant to so many burnt out athletes, I really felt that I had to I had to show them what I had learned through my own process. And so I really, when I watched your, your uh, program, I, I was like, wow, me and Timmer, we're in harmony. He's, he's, he's offering a, a, a soft form of exercise that's highly functional, just like I do through working in. So I just wanted to wrap my arms around you, give you a big <laughs> hug and a kiss and say, great work. Thanks, Paul, man. I, yeah, I really would would like to develop things further but it's to yeah to get that confirmation from you is great it's we we overshoot so much in training and we always there's this real ego mindset of push harder you can always give more and the amount of times i've burned out trying to live up to that and realizing that when i undershoot a workout i end up with more energy for my day i end up making better food choices and not over consuming and yes i think we all could do with a little more undershooting with our workouts well, if you undershoot your workout, you don't undershoot your ejaculation either. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Meaning you don't go to bed to make love with Too nothing high. left in you. And, yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, our body's always telling us. I, I find it fascinating that I've now had, I think, three men between 18 and 19 years old get a hold of me and ask me how to get off of Viagra. Wow. Yeah, And I'm like, wow, we're in deep shit when our 18 and 19 year olds are taking uh, Viagra so they can have good sex. I, I, I've said to all of them, I said, look, when I was your age, I could use my dick as a dinner bell. <laughs> it's like if you if you're having a hard time keeping it up at that age, we're in deep shit. Oh, gosh. Yeah. But yeah. Hey, uh, I'm really proud of you, Tim. And I, I, I honestly, if I could give you a hug and a kiss, I would. Maybe one day I will. Uh, if we can find each other in physical form, but I'm with you in heart and soul. And as soon as I, as soon as I read what my wife shared with me about you, I just, I just felt like I really needed to reach out to you and, and celebrate your bravery and your courage and your spiritual growth and development process and celebrate you as an athlete, because you're obviously a very accomplished athlete. And I'm very, very grateful that you're willing to sacrifice what you have and to go through the crisis of being rejected. And so I'd like to close by asking you if you were going to die tomorrow, and this is your last interview, what message would you like to share with humanity? Take care of your own happiness. I think the biggest thing I've learned is that my own joy in life and peace comes from taking care of that day to day and not chasing external things, but, but going within taking myself, to whatever practices bring me peace and making them a priority in my life. Like having something in your day that gives you, gives you joy, making that a priority. And that's always brought me all good things have stemmed from that. I've always attracted what I've needed in my life, not from chasing what I've needed, but just from focusing on my own balanced energy and not overshooting and burning out of, of energy and with, with training or with stress, with work, things like that. But just everything good seems to come from finding that, that peaceful place. My next uh, path for me I've had planned tomorrow and I'm going to have to delay it by a few days now due to unforeseen circumstances but is a pilgrimage there's a walk that goes from 
from near where I live in Derbyshire up into Scotland. And I, I recognize that as something our ancestors did that not so many people in our uh, generation especially seem to do these long walks and see what I can discover and, and not take a smartphone with me. And, you know, I started out with free running and then got into uh, running itself and then yoga and, and hiking now. And eventually someday I'll end up with the, just meditation and, and be ready for death just in time. Well, it's always perfect. In fact, I'm going to be doing a podcast or probably a series of podcasts because I've had many requests to share what I believe happens when I die, which is something I've looked into deeply. I, I won't go into it here, but I think you'll find it very, very fascinating. And I have had a dream of taking my children on a pilgrimage. So one day I might give you a phone call, see if you want to go on walkabout with me and my kids. I'd be, I'd love that. I'm sure we'd have amazing conversations. And I'd, I'd love to come up. You're in San Diego, right? Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to try and make, I want to make it out to sort of LA and California area sometime later this year. Maybe I'll, I'll reach out and I'd love to come check out yes. your place and lift some rocks and try and stack some, stack some rocks. Yes, I'd love to share that with you. You'll be amazed at my place here. I'm on top of a mountain. I'm looking out my window at a lake. I get bobcats coming up to my window, deer, coyotes. What's it piece something? Uh, you've got a name. Here? Yeah, the name. I call it Heaven, Heaven House. House. That is it. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Stunning. Hey, where can... Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. that was it. Just love to come out. I'd love you to come out, man. You're always welcome. Uh just to close, where can people learn more about you and what you have to offer? I think the the main place, I just took a 30 day hiatus from it, but I'm back on Instagram now. Uh, Human Timothy, H-U-M-A-N-T-I-M-O-T-H-Y. Human Timothy, or I have a video one from all my movement stuff is Tim Moves. So they're both on Instagram. And YouTube, uh, if you search again, Human Timothy, it will come up. I make YouTube content documenting. At the moment, it's a lot more of my my hiking and uh, and getting into the British mountains. I, I recognize Britain is, is my favorite island. I'm from here for a reason. And I, I, I traveled a lot my younger years, but I enjoy just exploring. There's enough of this island for one human. So I'm exploring a lot of this place for now. Though I was actually born in Connecticut. My parents are British. I moved here when I was three years old. So, Right on. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Tim, yeah. I can just tell you I love you, buddy. I'm proud of you. You're a great warrior. You're a great spirit. You're a great leader, a great teacher. And my hat's off to you, and namaste. Thank you, Paul. I love you too. I really appreciate you you helping guide me on this journey, and um, I look forward to the next time we connect. Thank you to the, all the viewers that listen. I uh, really do care about this earth and uh, all its inhabitants, and let's try and solve this together and help heal the planet. Aho, great spirit. Aho. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Tim Sheaf. You can find Tim on Instagram at Human Timothy or on his YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash livewire. Tim is generously giving Living 4D with Paul Check listeners a 50% discount on his Mindful Warrior movement course. Visit mindful warrior.com and use the code CHECK50 when you check out. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's blog at checkinstitute.com forward slash blog.